Okay, a wonderful good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Martin, and um, I have the honor of welcoming you to the second data week in Leipzig. Niels Hempelmann, Niels, can you cut, shortly stand up? Uh, and me, we will briefly present you some introductory details um, to the data week in a few minutes. But first of all, I'm, um, uh, I would like to ask Clemens Schülke, Mr. Clemens Schülke, to uh, come in front. And Mr. Schülke is um, deputy mayor. Is it right in English, deputy mayor? Um, uh, and he represents the Department for uh, Economics, Labor, and Digital Affairs. And um, yeah, I'm very, or we are very grateful to have him here to um, give a welcoming address. And Mr. Schülke, um, yeah, thank you. Ja, guten Morgen. Herzlich willkommen, Dr. Martin, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you in, in Leipzig. I would to like to welcome you in our new town hall and in the very shrine of our local democracy here in the plenary hall. My name is Clemens Schuke, and you already learned the long title, so I'm not going to repeat it. Important message for this morning, digital affairs that should stick. Uh, if you look around, you may think this is the old city hall. Many visitors even assume this is an old fortress, if you look at it. But it was opened just recently, 1905. Um, it is, however, built on the foundations of the Plassenburg Castle, the old castle. Anyhow, the new city hall uh, 118 years ago meant that Leipzig's administration not only had shiny new offices, hashtag newwork 1.0, uh, but we also erected a massive town hall tower. Since we are here for Data Week, please do note the data point. 114.5 meters high it is. And it was the highest of its kind in all over Germany. And I'm sure this was no coincidence. A building like this was designed to give more than just shelter for humble city servants, but also it was a symbol, a symbol to remind us where we come from, but even more to show where we want to aspire to go. The Leipzigers wanted to shape their cities to take the future of their cities in their own hand uh, in a modern and a sustainable fashion. This building is here, even 118 years after. And yes, a little bit they probably built it to show off too. But today we use different beacons to show progress, innovation and future. And one for sure is to meet and talk with friends like you from all uh, over the um, place. And uh, so, welcome to Data Week. A week full of presentations, discussions, networking lies ahead of you, but also a week to enjoy our city. And uh, for those of you I ha you haven't been here before, I would like to you remember four things about Leipzig. Number one, Leipzig is Germany's fastest growing city. And we are now number seven ready to surpass Stuttgart next. Over the last, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, its population has grown by 20%, and we are now at 624,000 inhabitants. Second, Leipzig has a rich musical heritage also. I only mention one name, Johann Sebastian Bach. Why do I do this? Because he lived here and worked for 30 years, and interestingly, the city council, maybe not in this building at this time, but. Uh, hired him almost exactly 300 years ago now. Last week we celebrated the Bach Festival, Johann Sebastian Bach Festival, 150 concerts from in 11 days, many guests from all over the world, and our mayor 
just spotted in one concert Sting. He was just sitting there as an ordinary customer with a ticket for 49 euros, but listening to the wonderful music of Bach. Number three, and this is probably important for you because it's your subject. Leipzig is a green city. Not only do we boast wonderful parks that are much greener than in Greenwich, believe me, I've been there last year. And uh, more importantly, we like it this way. So we want to contribute our share uh, and become carbon neutral by 2040 or even earlier. Different goals, not easy mechanics. So uh, we have even pledged this idea to the EU and are now one out of 100 model cities in Europe that take part in this mission of climate neutral and smart cities. Last, number four, Leipzig aspires a seat, a front seat in digitization, sorry. So where do we stand today? Together with stakeholders from business, science, government and citizens, we have forged our digital agenda, our city's vision and strategy for the digital future. And what's in it, you can see if you go just one floor down below in our exhibition. Among these goals we set, maybe the biggest challenge is how do we organize our massive data pools in a way that we can understand better how our city works. So we work on an urban data platform. In it we try to mirror our real city and the digital world. So, for instance, if you want to implement a new bike lane, it is much easier to plan and explain if you can simulate the outcome, the impact on cars, on trams, before you start digging. So we want to create a digital twin, or better, many digital twins, and probably many of you do the same. So we thought digitization is a challenge for every city. So why not crack the bigger nuts together? And this is what we do together with Hamburg and Munich, we develop and implement urban twins that do not only uh, contain the data of one city, but all three of them, and they connect the dots. So imagine the power of this combined data. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Please come on in. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about these inspiring subjects data week is the perfect platform and like every event like this we have partners that we couldn't do without so special thanks definitely goes to university of leipzig and its institute for applied informatics that co-created this event and also we are happy to have you here colleagues from Open Geospatial Consortium and the project All Data for Green Deal. And of course, I'd like to thank you, our organizing team from the Digital City Unit, Frau Ginze, and uh, the Office of Statistics and Elections. Please allow me one final thought and come back to this building. This is now 118 years old. And if you look at the technology in the time being, and now, we couldn't be more apart. But however they did their work at the time, and we do today, whatever instruments we use, whether we push paper or buttons, one thing shall never change. The reason why, the purpose. We as city servants, we should always strive to make the lives of our citizens better. And this is still true with all the technologies at our hands. So let us not worship the gods of digitization without asking why. Let us serve the people. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Schuke. These were perfect words for opening the Data Week. So, 
Um, yeah, let's proceed um, with our opening ceremony. Um, now um, I will give a few um, introductory details and afterwards Niels will um, yeah, uh, proceed. <laughs> so, in, uh, yeah, I introduced myself already, um, but let me uh, um, tell you a few things about the institute I am working on. Uh, it's called the INFI, the Institute for Applied Informatics, and from my point of view, it's very important for uh, Leipzig as well. So because um, we are um, um, uh, co-located or better connected to the University of Leipzig, our goal is to transfer scientific results to industry, to um, uh, to administrative uh, departments, to other science fields, and yeah, we are focusing for sure on IT, but um, we are um, organized in different working groups in different competence centers and so on and so forth. And uh, we are focusing as well on things like sustainability, on things like agriculture, on things like data, sure, on things like artificial intelligence and different uh, aspects and so on and so forth. And, the INFA itself is uh, about 50 members and uh, 150 employees, and I think it's a quite a uh, big bunch of people who are helping us to bring data to the society in, in the end. Okay, that's about the INFI. Let's uh, go a little bit uh, in the past. So from my point of view, the data week last year was a success. So, and if you can see, uh, we already did it here in these rooms. So we are happy in this case to do it again this year here. And um, while it was a success, it was the first um, data week last year. Uh, and we had there 70 or more than 70 presentations, talks. Uh, we had a lot of students on the conference um, giving insights in their student works uh, by uh, doing it with posters. Um, we had a set of sponsors last year. There were some uh, workshops uh, besides, and it was as well in a hybrid conference setup, so it was possible to join this conference as well digitally. And in the end, um, the most important fact, we had more than 300 participants. And if I believe in facts, and I do, um, I uh, would say uh, this year become as well a success. So because we have more talks, we have um, more participants. It's as well hybrid, so people can join. It becomes a little bit more, a little bit, it becomes more internationally. So we have this year a lot of participants uh, from other countries, other European countries here at the conference, and this is, um, yeah, awesome. So, and if you can imagine such an, um, Conference cannot be organized by one, two, three people doing this next to their normal job. Um, it's a quite big team. It was a quite big team to organize this event. And um, yeah, the team itself is um, widespread over different affiliations. So there are people from the industry, like the Essenza GmbH. Uh, there are people from the city, um, from the city of Leipzig, um, there are people from OGC, from INFI, from SCATS AI, and so on and so forth. And uh, here are the faces behind the um, uh, people who were um, um, very active in the organization. So if you have questions, please ask those people. Um, mostly they can give you the answers. So, and the next thing is, uh, such a conference needs as well some sponsors, sure. So, you can see um, um, them here on the slide, but those sponsors are not only on the slide, they are as well outside. So in the, I'm not sure how it is in English, it's Wandelhalle, Obere Wandelhalle. And if you want to talk to them, you can uh, go out, um, speak to the people, um, yeah, uh, come into discussion. Um, I would love to that um, this um, conference is an exchange platform for different topics, um, focusing on digital things. And um, yeah, um, yeah, okay. So finally, I would give um, a very, very brief overview about the conference itself. So okay, it's a data week, so that means um, 
it's a whole week and we divide it this week sure in days so um, today monday um, yeah it's a day um, we called it european innovation day and we have a lot of sessions here um, and uh, today and they are not only in this room there are other rooms so please have a look to the program the link is here um, and outside is as well a um, yeah, big screen you can have a look there um, and on Tuesday tomorrow we will focus a little bit more on um, fair data um, um, yeah, free data uh, on Wednesday um, we will uh, focusing on semantic uh, technology, semantic uh, web, um, yeah, the semantic behind data. And on Thursday and Friday um, it becomes a little bit more the focus on um, artificial intelligence. So in this case I'm very happy that we have a widespread program this year and on the left, right, it's left, um, there are some further topics, so because on, uh, there are some sidetracks uh, um, in the uh, um, conference, uh, so we organized a lot of trainings, tutorials, there was this Leipzig Open Data Hackathon and its results will be presented, uh, will be presented on the Data Week as well. There is this Data Science Mania, which will take taking place uh, this week, um, and a further Competence Center, um, K K K KMI, will um, yeah, um, present um, themselves the Leipzig Semantic Web Day and the AI tomorrow. So this were my last words. So and I will hand over to Niels now. And Niels is from OGC, from the Open Geospatial Consortium. And yeah, give him an applause too. Thanks, thanks for you. <laughs> right. Thanks a lot, Michael, for the nice introduction. Also Mr. Schulke Müller for the nice words. You will see uh, many of the ideas that you presented and we are uh, represented now in the upcoming uh, presentation in the upcoming days. I'm giving some details about the, um, the, the logic of the project, uh, of, the, of the program. And originally we were just, uh, um, uh, I wanted to make an innovation event here and I was asking the, the city of Leipzig for rooms. That was the initial seed and then they were saying, okay, we have an entire data week why not doing that together? So that was uh, what we made. So we had a nice conversation in the beginning and we're saying, okay, we are working on exactly the same, the same topics, so let's, let's do it together. That's why we are here, that I'm coming from the Open Geospatial Consortium. That's an uh, international um, organization and we said member base, so we have more than 500 members. So this is something like the European Space Agency, NASA, et cetera, et cetera. These are uh, members of uh, the OGC. And then plenty of my colleagues are here also in the rooms or associated with, with uh, plenty of different projects where we are involved. Basically, what we're doing in, uh, in OGC is uh, software standardization. So the OGC standards are kind of very well known, especially in the geospatial world. But then also we have a big uh, part of a program about innovation, or it's called COSI, with a collaborative solutions and innovation. And um, that's why we are kind of trying to find the good recipes for exactly the, the, uh, the questions addressed and the challenges for net zero cities, so climate change, biodiversity, uh, et cetera. And that's going to be the, the topics for the upcoming days. <coughs> it was coming, um, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the necessity or the idea of uh, setting these innovation days is coming from the um, uh, geo 3 and the Geospatial Enabled Ecosystem for Europe, one of the projects we are involved in that and the colleagues are here uh, as well in the room. We will have detailed presentations later on in the afternoon, as said also with a demonstration on their urban platform, what they are setting up, and uh, there are plenty of interests on further collaborations then for the future. So let's see what we can uh, find and set in synergies. <clears throat> the main scope of the ideas or what, it, what was working out is the question, you see that here in the titles for today, is that always Green Deal and then data space. Data space, Green Deal and Europe. And that, so the question, what actually is a data space? That's always uh, uh, very difficult to, under, to, to, uh, to explain or to make, or this is technically quite difficult to, to set in, in place. <coughs> We, we have the good luck that the European Commission will be presented uh, in, the, uh, in the afternoon as a, as a keynote. So they were giving the, the visions on uh, the digital transformation for Europe, how that works. And then we can see if 
Leipzig is in line with that, or how can we help out, and uh, how can uh, we kind of set up the synergies with different cities, etc. And, and uh, in the evening, there's a panel discussion uh, how these technologies that we're setting in place are actually helping out for transferring our life into a into a better uh, in, into a better uh, life standard. <clears throat> Based on that, uh, we will have several sessions where we then can deep dive into the technical details because in the different domains it is quite different. So we have a, climate, uh, uh, a data space for climate, agriculture, biodiversity. And there is the open science cloud, and said, which is kind of also a uh, data space or it's a cloud. or Well, we can discuss that then there in, in detail where it's actually moving to. And I would like to give you one of our diamonds that we can present here. So this is actually not a picture. This is a digital twin um, based on the data fusion with, uh, with, uh, out of several sources, you know, starting with uh, climate data, with that, uh, presenting uh, different scenarios in the future. And then there are 3D uh, tree species modeled and then said based on the climate change scenarios and that you can see that which species are actually surviving or which are coming up and, uh, and, and uh, how will uh, the, the city looks like on a small scale in the, in the future under the, the different, in different conditions of the environment. And then implemented all that into, into this uh, 3D uh, urban, urban platform, uh, <coughs> which is kind of created also out of a data fusion from different sources and that are filled in with artificial intelligence to kind of fill the, fill the gaps. And then that's one of the outcomes of a climate pilot that we have run uh, was running in, uh, in OGC and, that, and uh, it's a very kind of modern technology what we could offer to use here in Leipzig as well. Second one, and that, talking about urban planning. So tomorrow that's the urban planning uh, focus and that we have uh, a lot of different sessions around that. So details about how to set up urban planning and how, how to set up urban uh, digital twins or here it is called um, the, uh, uh, the, the building, building permits, which is kind of a different name, so we can kind of discuss also about the, the ter terminology. We have here, again, and that currently we are talking in English, but we can also talk in German. So we have uh, things uh, in, uh, we have uh, sessions in German as well, so for those who are more familiar with that. So language should not be the barrier, and there are plenty of people who can translate, and if that's, uh, in, if that's necessary. And then one of the things what has been also been pointed out, semantics is in all that technology is always a very crucial issue and that it will, is very, very important. So we dedicated an entire day for that and uh, with uh, talks about details and uh, presentations and then also lined up four blocks of workshops and uh, Alejandro is here and said, who is guiding that and said, and that's for everybody and said, who wants to learn more about semantics. So like me, for example, I'm not strong in that, and said, but uh, I will, I'm looking forward for that and said, to get more insights. In the end, there's also some hands-on sessions, if I understood it right, and said, so you can really get uh, an, an, a better understanding of, of semantics or talk about the details if you would like to do that. Talking about hand uh, training, so that's also kind of in all the days you will find training sessions and hands-ons. One uh, is also tomorrow afternoon is uh, presenting an entire academy, online academy, that, that you can use. And I don't know that many of you are uh, affiliated with universities and probably teaching, etc. So, so this is an, an, an offer, an online offer and so that you can use and so to, to, um, yeah, to organize your, uh, your, um, your teaching seminars. And last but not least, we need for sure also refresh the minds you know, that when it's uh, after all the difficult discussions and uh, the, the, the topic, so we have plenty of social events and then it was already pointed out there are plenty of things to do here in Leipzig, so some of them are organized here so if you would like to join. In the evening there is sparkling wine to kind of see our success for the first day <laughs> and uh, deep deep dive into discussions if, you, if there is a need. I also would like to point out, because uh, some of you are uh, associated to, to uh, scientific uh, associations and that are affiliating, so uh, around uh, the data week here, and we will have a special issue on the, uh, with the idea of uh, yeah, data spaces, actually, if you are finding an answer or if you are shaping the answer today or in this week, we can bring that into a scientific paper and then the, uh, uh, the submission of 
uh, manuscript will be by the end of the year. So you have still time to think about it. <laughs> and that's, from my side, a few of the details for the program. I'm very much looking forward for that. I think it's a really rich program, and I'm handing over then to, uh, who is the first? Lehmann. Mr. Lehmann. Mm -hmm. Where's the presentation now? So, sorry. Okay, after lots of words of welcome and introduction, I will continue with introduction or kind of. This one? Yes, this one. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to introduce the Enterprise Europe Network, in, especially in Saxonia, but also uh, as a whole. This network is the biggest network worldwide for startups and SMEs, that means small and medium-sized enterprises, with international ambitions. There are more than 3,000 local experts involved, more uh, almost 500, not really 500, but almost 500 organizations involved, as we, uh, as we do it. I'm from the Agile GmbH here in Leipzig, which is an agency for innovation and uh, uh, technology transfer, and we are dealing with SMEs especially as a daughter or daughter company of the Industry and Handelskammer, the Chamber of Commerce in, in Leipzig. And uh, there are a lot of such organizations in Europe. I will show a little bit maybe, or worldwide. And there are also almost 40 countries involved for this network. Uh, just a map to show how well this Europe is whole involved. Also some other countries as Canada, as uh, the United States, there are also some people dealing with this network. And in Germany, it's a regional organized network. That means uh, agencies such as ours uh, are also in Germany for the, for the different states. And a lot of services are provided. Uh, it starts with such things, you can read it, sustainability, digitalization, that's why I'm here a little bit. Uh, also uh, helping connecting the uh, companies in Europe, um, that means business partnering, a scale up of uh, startups, yeah, and the other things mentioned here. But it's, that's all the main course, I will talk a little bit later about some different points. Uh, there are also an area around, that means special European programs, which are also uh, connected to the Enterprise Europe network. Uh, yeah, we also help uh, companies to find the right programs, maybe, for uh, uh, to get money, <laughs> for example, for special projects, or to find partners for special projects. Uh, and that's a little bit, as I, as I said, uh, to show which is possible for us to do for companies. The services are free of charge for the companies. In the area of innovation, it means just to enhance, enhance the potentials of SMEs to innovate, grow and develop new product services and business models, uh, find partners, find uh, other companies uh, with, with the same or almost the same problems. Uh, to get new products to be better in the market. Uh, additionally, uh, the large area of sustainability, <laughs> that means uh, just to help the transition to a better uh, business models. Uh, we have also from the Enterprise Europe Network Saxony uh, such a check for this part of, yeah, services uh, which is lying out there in the Wandelhalle, <laughs> because no one knows the word in English maybe. Uh, you can have a look about it in German and I'm also here all the day to, if there are questions arise with the services which I'm presented here. Then the area of resilience, that means just we have shown in the last crisis uh, to empower the SMEs to get just handle some things better, that means uh, uh, the possibility to get material or to find new markets or, or other things. Then the area of the single market, the European single market, because uh, it's not so easy usually if you are an SME or a small company 
uh, to get all the legislations uh, in uh, in view and uh, have ideas how to how to get some uh, things you need to uh, um, sell your product in different markets. So just yeah, we can also help or find partners to help you in this case. Then uh, business partnering that's the main part. There are the database or yeah, a kind of a database available which is managed by people where you can put profiles in and say, okay, I have some products, I have an idea, I want to sell it in Spain, for example, but I, I know maybe in Spain they need the products, but I do not know every, <laughs> no one, or I can't, uh, I don't know anyone in Spain. So just uh, ask us and we can ask the partner uh, agencies in Spain, for example, and they are looking around which companies may fit the wishes we have and then they just connected each other and dealing or using us additionally or just direct. It depends on the, on the company wishes. Uh, digitalization, just to help a little bit uh, to find the right way for the companies, for the small one. Then the internationalization, it's a little bit with business partnering connected, of course, just to go to international markets, maybe alone or together with other partners. And the important area also access to finance, that means EU funding or the European funding to use it uh, for companies to uh, get new products, get new partners, get new markets. And startups and scale-ups are also important. Uh, that means uh, just helping them uh, to spread around Europe for scale-up or uh, uh, so startup scale-ups. Uh, startups usually are local, but then they are trying to scale up in this area of internationalization is a point, and we just help. Yeah, the services are free of charge. It's more or less the same as I mentioned already, so it's not need to talk about it additionally. How it works, international partnerships, there are the database I mentioned already, and there are also some uh, B2B meetings organized in uh, connection to often with fairs, and also some in some areas or sometimes also company missions possible just to go to other regions and look what's possible in the market. Advisory support, uh, just to look at the companies and look what they need. That's the main important point, I guess. Uh, if companies come to us and ask us, then we say, hmm, okay, <laughs> what's all you need? <laughs> what do you want? And then usually it's a kind, in, in every, uh, ever, more or less every case, it's a kind of advisory support because uh, yeah, you, you have just to follow the needs and to ask them and find the right ways. And the innovation support is a little bit different, but also quite the same, looking for, for funding possibilities, looking for partners, looking for European programs which fit the needs of the projects maybe, uh, but also uh, to look at the market sometimes, so it's uh, also more or less a kind of rule <laughs> service for the companies, which is free of charge. Sustainability assessment, as I mentioned already, we have it in, in Saxonia as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a possibility service uh, which we provide, but only for companies usually in Saxonia because we are regional organized, as I mentioned. So if you are from other areas, then just look for the EAN in your region or in your country and then in your region. I'm just going to show you a little bit about Saxony. We have eight locations here. Uh, which are more or less spread across Saxony, in Leipzig too, in, in close to in Glaubitz, close to Riesa one, in Zittau Görlitz one, in Chemnitz two, and in uh, yeah, and when, uh, uh, Dresden two, and one additionally is a Finanzgruppe from the uh, Sparkasse uh, is also involved as a associate partner to. Uh, help, especially in the area of the final financial support. Yep, that's more or less all. Get in touch, <laughs> ask, ask. That's the easiest way, I guess. Uh, I'm here today if there are questions arise. And maybe just look at the EN sites, en 
Deutschland, E in uh, Sachsen, and also the E in itself has a homepage where you can look for your problems. Thank you for the possibility to present it here. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Lehmann. Um, what I um, forgot in my opening words was that we have people here from the uh, uh, Leipzig University of Applied Sciences who are supporting us with streaming this conference. Um, they are in the behind. Um, so, and uh, the next important thing is that we have Johanna with us. So, and Johanna is an um, uplink. Um, is it an uplink? I'm not sure. So because Johanna um, um, is um, having a look to uh, chat where people from outside, from remote, can ask questions to this conference. So if Johanna is raising her hand, then does it mean that someone from outside have a question? So um, having a look to her as well. So thank you, Johanna, that you support this conference. So, but now, um, the next speaker is from a further research center here in Leipzig, uh, from the um, Helmholtz uh, Center. Uh, there she is. <laughs> and uh, in German, it's Umweltforschungszentrum. In English, it's Environmental Research Center. I'm not sure. So, yeah, perfect. <laughs> so then come in front and so presentation and so. Yeah, good morning to everyone. My name is Nora Mittelstedt, and I'm a scientist and project coordinator at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. I'm part of the research group Renewable Energies. And I'm very glad to present to you the EE Monitor, which is like my research baby of the last three years, um, which might be for you a specific example how to elaborate uh, geodata for the public and how to make it accessible. Yeah, um, we had, I will, I will show you the product, the research project, which is, which is online, and will explain to you our methodology and bring some results of the EE monitor. We had a mission. The Federal Institute for Nature Conservation asked us to create a data or information base for the public, for policymakers and researchers on the topic of the nature compatible energy transition. Or uh, we could also say about the nexus of nature conservation and the expansion of renewable energies. And what we created is this website, uh, the EE Monitor. And if you're already on your computer, I don't mind if you open it right away or on your smartphone while I explain the features. You might explore it by yourself. And this website has at least two features. One feature is a big monitoring about nature conservation and the energy transition, which uh, contains 41 indicators that describe the interrelation of both of them. And we, um, we created some categories. One category is the technology, so you will find indicators on wind energy, photovoltaic open space systems, hydropower, bioenergy plants, and overhead lines, energy system data. And on the other side, you will find target areas, which are targets for a nature-friendly energy transition. And then you can filter all these indicators for your interest and, um, and get to the dashboard that I will show in a second. How can you imagine those indicators? Here I brought uh, six of them. For example, we are monitoring the area distribution of ground-mounted uh, ground photovoltaic systems by land cover class. We are monitoring the length of high voltage and extra high voltage overhead lines in nature conservation areas or in general, or the distance of wind turbines to protected areas, how the distance develops and uh, et cetera. And what is also possible, this is another feature that you can create a regional report. For example, you, you search the data for Leipzig or for Saxony, and then you get all the available data for your, for the, your region of interest. 
Yeah, this is a dashboard. We created this during the pandemic. So we were inspired by the dashboard, uh, the Corona dashboard of the Robert Koch Institute, uh, where the data is represented um, in a web GIS. So you can see regional tendencies. And here you can see the development of the distance uh, of wind turbines to protected areas, which is getting smaller and smaller over time. And then you can filter also by different protected areas, for example. Yeah. A second feature is our um, WebGIS, which uh, visualizes all renewable sites uh, in Germany, uh, the site data and the area data. In this case, you can see the area data for a photovoltaic plant, which is built on an old uh, airport. And then uh, you can see all the sites in a certain region, if you select a region, for example, and uh, there will be a visualization of uh, properties of the plant. So, for example, the installed capacity or the area and uh, the position, et cetera, the inclination of the modules. I will tell you something about the methodology. Um, if you're interested very in detail, you can also check our publication where we explain how we co-write all the geolocations, which was a lot of work. Because if you take the official register, um, which is called Marktstammdatenregister, you will see many of the wind turbines are outside Germany because the positions are not correct. So we had to um, go further, or we had to go a lot of steps to co-write the single uh, wind energy plants. plants. Um, we published this data set, so it's available for the public, and many other research institutes use our um, geolocations. For the indicators, all the calculations of every indicator are transparent within the EE monitor. So there's an information button, and then we explain this is the database, this is how we calculated it, etc. We faced some problems the last years because uh, some indicators have a uh, limited informative value um, of the data. So we, you will see in the image sometimes we write, oh, be, be cautious, we think this number is too low. I think we think that uh, information got lost in the official register. Yeah. Today I brought some results that I created by myself with the app so the results that I brought, you would be able to create these results by yourself at home. Um, for example, we observed within the app that um, wind energy turbines are more and more installed in, nat in uh, protected areas, especially nature parks, landscape conservation areas, and also European bird sanctuaries. Um, yeah, you can see the development above, and uh, you can see also regional tendencies. So, for example, in Nordrhein-Westfalia, there are many, many wind turbines in um, protected areas. What, that's, that's bad news, and good news is that there are only a few wind turbines in hardly protected areas, like nature conservation areas, biosphere reserves, or national parks. And, and we observed that uh, most of the wind turbines are installed on agricultural land. And if you're interested in the uh, specific land cover classes, you can filter within the app where are they installed, for example, which kind of agricultural land, etc. And there's another development that more and more wind turbines are um, constructed in forests. About solar energy, um, there's one result that the area efficiency is, um, yeah, has more than doubled in the last 20 years. So at 2020, the average was 0 0.59 megawatt per hectare. And if you build a photovoltaic plant today, you might reach also one megawatt per hectare. So this average will rise. And same uh, for the solar energy, it's uh, the photovoltaic ground mount installations are mostly constructed on agricultural land. And one third on uh, build up areas like the airport that I showed before. 
to um, finish my presentation, uh, our research group, we brought some um, conclusions for you today that might be also of interest for the future. So we think that it's a good basis for integrate uh, more data. We tried that two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, we integrated floating photovoltaic. We wanted to start a monitoring of floating um, photovoltaic. And we face um, the problem of data availability. We would like to um, get more data on biodiversity, species, etc., and integrate it into the monitoring. And we are still developing, um, or we try to reach some progress in automatization because we are working a lot, uh, yeah, like correcting the sites uh, by our hand, etc. And uh, this is a goal. And yeah, what what we can see uh, is we we are analyzing historical data, but actually we see trends for the future. This is uh, a further conclusion. And we know that there are several projects uh, trying to analyze geolocations of renewable energies with uh, artificial intelligence. So we are waiting for results um, of that. Yeah. And we would like to, uh, we are looking forward to extend the monitoring to the European Union, but we know that there are only a few countries uh, monitoring the sites like we do. Yeah, this is us. This is our QR code. And, uh, you can come to me, talk to me, and if you're very interested in our science, I also brought our publications. Yeah, thank you very much for these, for both interesting talks. So, um, Nora, can I ask you, um, you are uh, here today, so people who possibly have questions can ask you in the breaks and so on. Yeah, I'll uh, stay until one. That's perfect. So, are there questions in the chat? Okay. Yeah, Niels. Just, just to announce the next session. So, we will have a coffee break outside. <laughs> that's the next session. <laughs> um, kind of for a possibility to deep dive in discussions. And then in a half an hour, we will meet again here again. And there is uh, five talks lined up uh, dedicated to the Green Deal. We thought these are all sister projects and uh, with different angles. We thought how to uh, support the Green Deal, how, which kind of uh, applications will be possible there. And um, yeah, I'm looking very much forward for these sessions. And then we'll see each other then here in a half an hour. And the speakers, please send me your presentations.
really happy to do that because they are the sister project. And I'm welcoming Jean Marceau from AD4GD, who is actually very much supporting this data view. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Neil, for that uh, introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, talking about uh, several initiatives towards the European Green Deal, and in particular to this uh, all data for uh, Green Deal. That's the project that actually Neil has, was more involved than me in the uh, elaboration of the drafts, but now uh, the CREAF is the, the partner that is diving it, and I'm somehow trying to chase the other partners in to make that uh, happen. So data spaces. Data spaces, data spaces are uh, cyber infrastructures that uh, actually enable the connection between the different data providers. They uh, deploy services to, sh uh, to share data, to process data. They include uh, fair governance, access rights, and they, and they improve the data quality and the interoperability of uh, the different uh, actors available. So there are several thema uh, thematic data spaces, and maybe by now you know them all. Uh, the one that we are going to talk uh, more today is this Green Deal data space that has this central position there, but we need to acknowledge that there are others, some others more advanced than others, maybe the health and the agriculture are the, the, the ones that are more active. The ultimate uh, aim is to actually create a single European data space, a genuine uh, data market for data, so we shouldn't also uh, forget that. We will see if uh, with the resources we have we get into the, this aim, but I assume that the, the Commission understood the difficulty on that, so that's why first we are starting in uh, thematic data, data spaces. Actually, there are others that, that, that are contributing to the data space, and in particular the European Open Science Cloud that was initially uh, designed as a, as a processing cloud for, for scientists has become the science, research, and innovation uh, data space. So we are talking about the Green Deal, and the idea is uh, that the European Union should become the first uh, resource-efficient and competitive economy without net emissions uh, of, ground, of ground greenhouse gases in 2050. And uh, the challenge uh, is the vast amount of uh, diverse and distributed data resources uh, from many stakeholders, different sectors, application domains, government schemes. So that's why the, we believe the answer is the creation of this Green Deal data space to, to actually uh, integrate better what is uh, out there already existing. So do you want a recipe on how to create uh, data space? So in principle, you bring the, the actors together. Uh, so that means uh, you bring the public sector, the scientists, uh, the research infrastructures, uh, maybe the citizens, uh, the, the smart cities, uh, whatever. You put them together. You create a legal framework based, of course, on, on, on Inspire, on the GDPR, on the high value data sets, uh, directives, etc. You identify the data sets needed. Uh, maybe they, they are the data sets from public sector, socioeconomic data. Maybe they, they are in situ networks from the research infrastructures. Maybe this is local knowledge from the citizen science. Maybe that satellite uh, data from the space agencies. You prepare a technical in interoperable infrastructure based uh, mainly on services that allow you, an APIs that allows you to share the data, to process the data to uh, have uh, these data associated with semantics, to uh, allow for authentication, authorization, and you define a government structure. Uh, so you uh, mainly define the rule of participation, the sustainability plan, this kind of stuff. So this is where uh, AD4GD wants to participate. We are part of this journey to create the Green Deal data space. We are not doing this alone, fortunately. With, so in cooperation with other groups, we want to integrate standard data sources uh, from exactly the list that I enumerated uh, before. And we want to demonstrate the potential of uh, this uh, data space in concrete pilots 
that address climate change, air pollution, biodiversity issues, and the way we can solve them. So we believe that our spirit is just widening the space. We started here, I don't know, 20 years ago, talking about Inspire. Uh, that was uh, something that I believe revolutionized the, the way we understand open data in Europe now. But uh, of course, other initiatives has been uh, also addressing this uh, same issue from different perspectives. And I'm just mentioning here the Envry Hub, the Envry community, and also the efforts on, on open data from uh, Copernicus. But there is more space. So we can integrate the, the Internet of Things, uh, so the sensor wall, we can integrate the citizen science, we can also integrate the modeling and uh, the artificial intelligence wall. Uh, so our way is an open approach using modern standards to actually allow for this integration, 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 uh, taking into account the end users. So we want to, in other words, we want to de-silo the thing, no? So we want to actually uh, remove some of those silos to increase interoperability, encourage, encourage the new OGC APIs. Uh, we want to use this semantic uh, interoperability with the concept of the essential uh, variables, and I will talk more about that in the high-value data sets later. We want to use this spirit of building blocks, those are these small pieces that you can replace and, and improve uh, while you are building the, the data space. We want to defragment the space by allowing a better sharing, better application of the FAIR principles. We want uh, to collaborate on defining these flexible governments. Actually, there isn't much government in our project itself, but, but nevertheless, we will participate in the discussions for that, and those discussions will impact on us. And we want to build trust. And uh, using this legacy of data quality and governments that we have been working with other people for quite a while, uh, we want to actually do that. We are taking a look at what others are doing. Uh, for instance, the International Data Space Association. Uh, that's an interesting approach, but they are missing the geospatial aspect here. Uh, there is nothing about data visualization and data processing in this schema, so what we want is to actually, maybe we can save this uh, fundamental part on, on logging participants, on generating the necessary certi certificates and tokens and all this stuff uh, that is solved in the IT infrastructure, but uh, there is this missing SDI uh, part, so what we want is to add these uh, modern geospatial uh, OGC APIs, um, or if when possible, when not possible, the, the web the old web services, and we can see here the, the coverage services, the sensor services, the processing services, the visualization services just in the center, and of course the metadata catalogs and the semantics uh, are there. So this is what we want to complement by, again, uh, integrating with uh, these uh, APIs the data sources that, that I enumerated before. And uh, to demonstrate that in concrete examples, we want to contribute to Sebe. Oh, the, 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 the slides were so nice and with so fancy animations, and now you uh, cannot see it, a, anything. But anyway, I, uh, what I'm trying to say, I didn't touch anything, I believe. <laughs> Just this button here. Uh, okay. What I was saying is uh, that uh, we are not working alone. We, we want to uh, definitely collaborate with the, with the OGC in uh, this creation of the, the OGC APIs uh, for better, con better connection with the IT mainstream. How is the IT? mainstream working, not very well, uh, not better connected. Uh, as I said, we, we want to collaborate with, with, with the OGC on, uh, on others on creating these essential variables, vocabularies, Ooh, it's back. Uh, and finally, the, the, the ISO TC211 is proposing a, a draft paper on how you can build the, the data spaces using just special standards. We are, we are also part of this initiative. I'm just mentioning things that we are going to do uh, relatively soon. 
uh, what we are also going to do is pilots. Uh, and we have three of them. There, there, there is uh, something about lakes in Berlin. Uh, we want to actually uh, understand how uh, lakes in Berlin work in terms of uh, water quality, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, people using them. Uh, that's one possible uh, example. We are also thinking about extending this to another project that, that, that we had that was uh, that is called uh, WQEMS. That is actually uh, lakes-based Copernicus infrastructure proposal uh, to actually monitor lakes in general uh, using remote sensing. We are going to, to do also biodiversity, and this is you can you cannot guess, but this is actually next to the Barcelona airport. Uh, so you are not seeing the airport; you are seeing what is disturbed by the airport in terms of this small patch uh, that is quite rich in biodiversity but is disconnected for the rest of the metropolitan area. We are going to study connectivity uh, on, on, on these patches using uh, the data space. No? And also we have uh, this uh, uh, third uh, pilot about air quality monitoring. We want to do that in the Milan area in Italy. Uh, we, we, with bands that, that are going to measure uh, air quality and this give us the, the sensor part of the, of the integration. This is also something that we can connect with another project that we, uh, we have that is called CityOps that is going to do air quality monitoring with citizen science in 85 uh, different cities. So that's something, this connection is something that we would like also to explore. Well, that's a lot of work. Fortunately, I don't have to do it alone. This is the list of partners that are helping me in, in, in this. It's more than helping. Actually, they are doing the work. I'm just uh, saying that I'm the coordinator. So, I'm, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, it's a good team. I'm, I'm proud of this team. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can, I can tell you more about what we are going to do. We are now approaching a critical moment in the project where everything is somehow settled and it's time to, you know, uh, start really hands-on on, on, uh, on our work, no? So next year is critical and actually we are going to have a close meeting, uh, plenary meeting of the project where I'm going to transmit exactly this, this message and in a year time I hope that in this event or in another similar event I can tell you the result of this push uh, that we are going to do uh, next year. As I said, we are not doing this alone and the community is uh, big and there are other projects that are going to be presented here, uh, so I'm not going to tell you anything about them. The, uh, more, more projects that all together we, we, we have this action group on the Green Deal data space, also the Eiffel on climate, the Iliad on oceans, the Open Air Monitor in, in processing and the EO4 EU in artificial intelligence and others. We will continue our discussions in Bolzano. This is work in progress. So again, I'm saying this is uh, something that we, we need to do together. And finally, this is an advertisement, sorry for, for, for that. This is an special issue on data spaces that we are starting to promote. Uh, so uh, these discussions that we are going to have here and now if they can be transformed into a scientific publication, we are proud to offer you this opportunity. And thank you for the time that I spent talking about uh, AD4GD with you. Great. Th thanks a lot, John. And then while I'm switching the presentation, there are one or two questions allowed. If there are any in the room or in the chat, I don't know. Yeah, thanks for, for the nice talk. I have one question regarding the protocols you are using, the technical implementation. The IDSA protocol is inherently incapable of accommodating services, uh, which would be necessary in you. Have you looked into Gaia-X for doing that? Yeah, uh, we, 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 have a, we have a partner in particular in the, in the project that has previous experience with, with Gaia-X, and I'm eager to, to learn more about uh, how, how this uh, will evolve. 
but I cannot give you a concrete answer. Okay, but you're doing it because that would be a complementary uh, the, the European initiative and it would be a miss if, if you do not even at least evaluate it, I, I think. think yeah. That is true. Be because the IDSA definitely is not sufficient, it won't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I'm using that as, a, as an example uh, okay. precisely of incompleteness uh, in order to explain the, the constellation of things that we sure, need okay. to, to, to put together. But that's good, yeah. But I understand that evil is in the details. <laughs> It is, yeah, and it won't work if you yeah. don't look. Yeah. All right, I think we need to move forward. So we are already running out of uh, running out of time. So thanks again, John, and we have multiple other sessions where we can deep dive in in the technical discussions. Sorry for <laughs> that. All right, then I'm introducing. Oh, I need to say something. There's not allowed to drink and eat here in the room remove that <laughs> and um, as with a little exception for the for the speakers right okay all right, all right. thank you Niels and uh, welcome everybody good morning uh, my name is Mark Dietrich I'm the a senior advisor with the EGI foundation we are a partner with the Green Deal the great project which is a coordination and support action to prepare for the Green Deal data space so we're going to talk a little bit about where that's going. And uh, my role in the project, uh, uh, amongst other things, is to be technical manager to try to bring the, bring the pieces together. So what is the Green Deal data space? I'll describe what has been shared in, um, in publications. It's part of the, the dual, the twin transition uh, of uh, green transition and digital transition. So it's a little bit of a centerpiece. Um, which makes just all that means is that we get a lot of pressure from the EC to produce. So uh, they define the Green Deal data space as a federation of data ecosystems enabling policy, business, research, citizens to jointly tackle climate change. So we'll talk more about the definition in a moment. So the project itself is about building a foundation for it, drawing together a community of practice. It is a short project. We are almost done. It doesn't feel like that, but feel, we have a very short time time left. We have 18 partners, uh, excuse me, 11 partners with three associated partners, and uh, a lot of the a commonality with some of the folks in CREAF that uh, Jean just uh, presented, as well as a lot of expertise in a, a number of areas. The Green Deal, the European Green Deal, is a very diverse area. It covers a number, quite a number of policy areas, but because there are other data spaces that touch other policy directions much more directly. For example, farm to fork is covered by the agricultural data space. We selected three policy areas, climate change and adaptation, zero pollution and biodiversity. They happen to be the same as AD for GD, so uh, we have a lot in common. Uh, so we're focusing on those as use cases because it's a huge area to cover and we hope to make some progress. We'd like to have something concrete to discuss as opposed to being overwhelmed by the range of things. So the organization of the project is that we are bringing together a community of practice, which includes industry, government, citizens, and the, uh, the research and academic community. We're gathering requirements from those. We're feeding those through three dimensions, which is what information do they need, how do we bring it together technical, technically, and what is the governance and business framework that will allow that to work. And then we translate that into the requirements and a roadmap to allow for implementation. So the next step for the Commission is to convert this from a CSA, a coordination and support action, to an implementation project, a procurement. So there's not going to be a research project. There's going to be build it now. So how will that proceed? Our approach is to gather requirements through use cases. These are the, some of the ones that we're working with, but informally we're working with a great number of areas. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example, just the, the presentation earlier today by Nora Mittelstadt on the uh, EE monitor. Great use case. What data do they need? How do they bring it together? What services do they need? How, what anal analytics are necessary to produce a result? And was the result useful? Could it be used to do something sensible in terms of making decisions on an individual level or making decisions on a government policy level? From a design standpoint, use cases are important because they define how you create value. And we have a range of things 
I'm afraid that in many data spaces, the theory is if we make a big pile of data, magic will happen. And I do not believe this. That is level one there. There's also a level zero, which if I just show up, if I just put my logo on the, on, in the catalog, also good things will happen. That's the least of our objectives. What we want is something much more aggressive. We want to provide real, actionable results. So let's talk about the data ecosystem. What are the objectives? Our problem in the Green Deal Data Space Project Great is to accommodate the diversity of objectives and scale and scope and business models. So that's the challenge. How do we do this? So first, let's come back to the definition of a data space. I'd like to present one. Neil's asked this question before. I'd like to present one from the Data Space Support Center, which is an infrastructure that enables data transactions between data, different data ecosystem partners, parties, based on the governance framework of that data space. So the infrastructure is, doesn't necessarily have to be digital, it's very likely, but it could be a library, physical library with books and shelves and a card catalog. Uh, data transactions, it's more than just physically transferring data, it's doing it in a controlled fashion, a prudent fashion. And the governance framework, it's the key characteristics of the data space itself, its purpose, its objectives, the rules, for example, the membership structure, and the standard terms and conditions of the data transactions it supports. So I'm going to show a few pictures, so first a little guide to the pictures. The big octagon is the data space. Sort of the giant will twist and play around with the, this octagon. Uh, inside it we have governance framework and specific con conditions for contracts. Those are governance artifacts. We also have as an example one service, the metadata catalog. We have participants who are outside of the data space. And we have data transactions between participants who, that also occur fundamentally outside of the data space. Some designs actually include it passing through the data space, but in many cases it's not. A party can join multiple data spaces, so you're not uniquely associated with one data space. Services and data are also outside of the data space, but can be listed in multiple data spaces. Having, by the way, having commonality of parties, participants, data, and services doesn't mean there's an overlap or there's some sort of relationship between the data space. They're still independent. They have their own governance frameworks. So what is the data ecosystem versus the data space? I think, and I think we have a, a theory that's working out where the data ecosystem is outside a data space and people make conscious decisions to bring, to join the data space and to bring their data and services. And there are also core services inside the data space that are, if you will, data intermediary services. This is important under the Data Governance Act, which now has some specific requirements about data intermediation services. Now, is the Green Deal data space one data space or in multiple? I think it might be multiple because we have a big ecosystem, we have lots of levels, we have lots of thematic areas, we have lots of regional requirements, we have different use cases. The, 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 the list goes on and on of why bringing it all together in one, into one big pile might be not reasonable. So multiple data spaces allows us to address multiple member state and sector specific laws. This does not create some sort of, uh, shall we say, formal relationship, but it allows for flexible communication, flexible transmission of results from one data space to the next. It, these also could be other areas. So it could be, you know, a water data space. It could be an energy data space, et cetera. We know these exist. It would help us to achieve quality and consistency amongst their data because we know there are issues of going from city data to regional data to, uh, uh, to national, to the EU levels. How do we manage that without having the whole thing crash by rec being very rigid? And this approach might be more flexible. Where are, I, I, uh, Niels listed me as Dr. Mark Dietrich. I'm not a doctor. I have a PhD in stupid questions. And my major stupid question is where are the things? So where are the AI models? To me, they're outside of the data space. They're operated by their providers. They, get, they can access data, they can produce results, they can provide the results under their control into the right data spaces. So it's outside. This is actually very consistent. So this picture here, very consistent with the EOSC model. Gory, are you paying attention? 
Um, so I think this is very much the same view as the EOSC model. So we have the data space as being EOSC exchange and the inside as being EOSC core. So where are the digital twins? Again, outside. We can have many of them. We can have many of them. What is the, where is the actual storage and processing? This is something that I think is going to be very critical. In geospatial data more than any other, because in, let's say, manufacturing or agriculture, the data volumes are not so great. In the geospatial world, the data volumes are huge, and we need to make some specific, specific accommodation for the data gravity, the processing requirements, et cetera. So we need a model for this. So uh, I see the data space as a, uh, a, a data layer, an access layer, a way to bring together the data in a logical structure and to allow some flexibility underneath. So how do we bring that together? So how do we achieve interoperability? Technically, I think we should co adopt common technical components and building blocks. So I'm in agreement with uh, Dr. Mazo. Uh, an identity and trust framework. Here I think we need a common identity and trust framework, at least in our domain and perhaps as broadly as we can make it work. And I do think the guy, where is this gentleman? Uh, the Gaia-X trust framework, his identity and trust framework is quite useful and promising, so I, I encourage that. Uh, we will need a master list of trust anchors. We will need verified credential types, as well as using common accepted standards from the W3C for verified credentials and presentation. We'll also need some master registries, data models, vocabularies, things that aren't sitting inside a data space that uh, hopefully are are more common. This will enable a lot of, of interoperability, having improving semantic interoperability because it's improving semantic meaningfulness or commonality. Operational and organizational. Two of two items from John's uh, magic super easy recipe, five minute recipe for building a data space were legal frameworks and governance structures. So yes, these are very important and we need to figure those out. It'll take us about a week and a half, or a year, or three years, I don't know. It's, uh, it's actually something that in, uh, in EGI we're focusing on. It's not trivial. Uh, finally, establish a common understanding of the relevant legislation and contract law. There are issues with, um, there are some issues with this. Some of the laws from the EU are not completely understandable. You will say, where is semantic interoperability? I did not forget it. So let's use the, let the use cases drive this, but require transparency. So allow many flowers to bloom, and we can compare and contrast and find the stuff that works and allow people to make the investments that have return for them. And that's the end. And Niels is almost ready to turn off my mic or unplug my <laughs> show. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks. And again, we're switching the, the presentations. There is uh, one or two questions allowed. Thank you. Um, so I did not see in the partners uh, a lot of industry representatives. They were at research institutions. And um, do you have uh, or do you, do you plan to involve uh, business side in development of these data spaces uh, or? So a very quick answer to that is one, uh, one party is the European Association for Remote Sensing Companies, uh, ERS, that's actually a partner in the project and they are an industry association that represents several hundred companies who are involved in this activity. Uh, we also have several organizations as part of our advisory board from industry to help guide us in this area. I absolutely agree there needs to be as much integration and alignment with the needs of industry as possible, so I, I fully support that point. It's, I, I don't want this to be just a research project. All right, great, thanks. And then the second question. Thank you, Mark. Great presentation. I like your step from data spaces to data ecosystems. Having said that, I want to ask you, wouldn't we have to go steps further in the sense of having an information ecosystem so that the data make the distinction that makes difference to the people and from that information ecosystem to a practice ecosystem so that we can really change behavior finally? 
I, I think that's a fair point. Um, I'm not sure entirely how to solve that. I, uh, going from data space to data, eco data, data ecosystem, suggesting that we might try for some consistency amongst the ecosystem and allow for data spaces to be a little bit more diverse within that ecosystem, that's a big step. That's different what pe from what people are talking about. So I'm sure some people in this room are, are currently on Twitter t explaining how crazy I am. So uh, let's, let's take it, let's deal with one crazy idea at a time. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Marek, and the, all the questions that, that's touching the point of information and knowledge, open knowledge, and things like that. We're moving forward uh, to the BQ project, looking very much forward to that and that addressing a specific uh, topic now as well, because in biodiversity, right? Yes, uh, I'm feeling a bit of imposter syndrome coming on here after those two talks. Um, but uh, my talk is uh, introducing the BQ project. Um, and uh, let's see how that fits into data spaces. So I'm Quentin Groom. I work at the Mines Botanic Garden. I coordinate B-Cubed. Um, B-Cubed is about standardizing biodiversity data for improving policy making. The central challenge around B-Cubed is creating um, rapid and reliable and repeatable workflows for uh, biodiversity to create information relevant for policy making. We see a lot of opportunities at the moment. This is this has kind of been a dream within biodiversity informatics for a long time. And we see the opportunity of a lot of data being produced, high quality data being produced, um, the models and the indicators have already been developed, and uh, we have dissemination platforms. But what we don't do at the moment is put that all together. And we can't, at the moment, and that's what BQ is trying to do, produce these workflows that can produce rapid, repeatable output. Um, and let me talk a little bit about the central challenge of that in the complexity of biodiversity data. So just quickly going through it, we have two billion specimens in the world's uh, um, museums and herbaria. Uh, these are some of the best known specimens. Two billion isn't actually that many in terms of biodiversity data, but these have been very well identified. There are about 60 million pages from the Biodiversity Heritage Library and many other um, sources of biodiversity literature, and they hold all the information about known biodiversity, which is about 1.2 million species, and of course there's another sort of 7.5 million species that we don't know about. There are other kind of data sets, such as grid surveying, which is, is really suited to uh, stationary organisms like plants, which is my interest. And I would go to a square and tick all the plants in it and produce grid maps like this. And there's quite a lot of those in Germany as well. There's tracking data. So uh, we have tracking data for birds, where we stick something on their backs and track them uh, with satellites or even uh, passively. And then we catch the bird again and, and get it off them. But there's also tracking data for fish, for whales, um, for, oops, did I fix? I lost it. Um, uh, there's elephant tracking data. You name it. There's tracking data. There's lots of trapping data. So this, I oh, can't see it. Damn it! It's a nice malaise trap up there. Well, I can see it perfectly well. Come on. Uh, there's trapping data for mammals. There's trapping data. Um, uh, such as mist netting for bats, there's bird mist netting data as well, uh, a whole bunch of different sort of trap data. There are marked individuals data. So this is a Californian condor, number 19, and as you probably know, California condor is incredibly rare, and there's only a handful, well, there's more than a handful left now, but they, they did get down to a very small population. Uh, but you must know about banding data as well, mostly from birds, but also other animals as well. And so we have massive amounts of these data as well. Although I must say that banding data in general is one of the most closed data sets we have. Uh, since the turn of the millennium, we've had an explosion in the use of camera traps. Uh, we're still struggling about the workflows to try and analyze all these data. Um, we have people looking at these, identifying their animals on there. Um, but there's also lots of other information that we can get from that, but we, at the moment, can't process it that quickly. And so we're looking at things like artificial intelligence to give us that insight, but of course that brings new problems in as much as training data sets have to be right, not biased, but also when we get the results back, they come back with a probability, and we're not used to dealing with observation data that comes with a probability as well. 
And of course, the great elephant in the room is the citizen science data. Um, citizen scientists collect observations of biodiversity from places scientists could only dream of getting to and from a much broader range of taxa um, and places. We have tools like iNaturalist and eBird that are creating tens of millions of observations from all over the world um, as we speak, literally. And of course, with all those images, uh, you may just see a picture of a wasp up there, but I see a picture of a wasp, I see a picture of a plant, and I see a picture of a wasp interacting with a plant. So there's actually three observations in the one picture. And, and tools like iNaturalist, where we have all these pictures, are full of this secondary data. And that's, we have only just touched on the tip of all the data we could be extracting from these pictures that are available openly on the internet. I didn't even mention eDNA. We've got all that data, but eDNA opens a whole other world to us of even uh, biodiversity we weren't, we weren't even aware of, undescribed biodiversity. All of these techniques, particularly things like eDNA, come with their own parameters of what they're good for. Um, they all provide part of this holistic ecosystem. Of, I shouldn't use the word ecosystem. We really should avoid ecosystem because it can just confuse these people like me. Um, every technique provides one part of the whole. Without uh, um, all of these techniques, we can't see everything. Uh, and so it's really good to be embracing all of these data and sharing all of these data. And everything needs to be uh, aligned with all of the environmental observation data that we're getting. I mentioned remote sensing, so radar, drones, satellites, but there's also lots of other kind of environmental data that we need to link with biodiversity data. So that brings me to be cubed. B cubed about trying to simplify this and try and create a policy alignment. So the first, one of the first things we're doing, at least, is looking at European policy and what sort of information we can provide from biodiversity data rapidly and repeatedly so that people can make good decisions on biodiversity and follow up on policies that are made. We're also looking much more widely at global policy, particularly looking at the indicators for the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, and so we have uh, an element of the project looking at that too and what we can provide in that context. So what are our solutions? Um, well, we're, we're very much based in uh, biodiversity data cubes. Biodiversity data is so heterogeneous, as I've demonstrated, that we really need to reproduce, uh, reduce it to something that people can use, really looking at the what, where, when, uh, when organi where organisms occur. It's not perfect for everything, but for a lot of what we work on in biodiversity, that's what we need. But it takes a lot of processing power to reduce all of that stuff down to uh, some things. We're also creating other kinds of cubes, looking at modeling of those data, um, projecting into different scenarios so we can look into the future. Um, we're also creating indicators from those, uh, from those data, such as phylogenetic diversity indicators, where we can look at the phylogenetic diversity with time and space. Um, looking at the impacts of in invasive species and also looking at the robustness of the indicators and models that we create so that we can communicate that to, to policymakers um, and to give them some idea of the reliability of the information. We will create exemplar workflows. Um, one of the things I, when I listen to some of the talks today already is I think about the poorer countries. I work in Belgium in, in a, in a European context, it's one of the poorer countries, and we can't do things alone. We, in Belgium, share a lot of the things we do, and we use shared data. We work on open uh, data, we work on open software, because we can't afford to do it ourselves. Maybe Germany can, uh, but the vast majority of countries in the world can't uh, do that. So uh, we're looking a bit at artificial intelligence in terms of how to improve species distribution modeling and we're trying to create uh, automated workflows, and we're particularly trying to do that using cloud computing, because that not only gives the sort of scalability that we need to do this, but one of its great features is the, w the way it allows us to collaborate between different institutions, not just within B cubed, but also giving people access uh, to our workflows remotely, which you can't so easily do when um, you try and do things locally. Our activities, uh, we're working on the software requirements and assessments at the moment. Uh, we will be able to produce cubes very soon. Um, I think we actually do have the software to do it. So if you actually want a cube of biodiversity data for your own area, from your own uh, parameters, please do come up to me afterwards and ask for it. I could probably find you somebody who can make it for you. 
However, later on this year, beginning of next year, um, we'll have the software online so you can do it yourself um, and we can produce the data cubes for any particular area, for any time frame, etc. April next year, we're playing a hackathon. Uh, we would love to see all of you there working on how to make a cube, what you can do with cubes when you've got them, and try to uh, do novel things uh, with data cubes of biodiversity. And later on, we will have training and support um, open to get to, to capacity build. Uh, we have four case studies, one based in Flanders in an area of high biodiversity, no, low biodiversity <laughs> and uh, high data availability. Uh, we have one um, in South Africa, which is high biodiversity, low data availability, and we're looking at um, biological invasions there. Uh, we have a stakeholder-driven case study, which we don't know what that's going to be yet, but people like yourselves will hopefully help us define what that's going to be, and we want to do something uh, impactful and different in that. And uh, quite excitingly for me, we have a case study on looking at global change, and I'm not really sure uh, what, that's, what we'll be able to show with that, but it's going to be quite interesting to see what is possible. This is our consortium. I won't mention everybody, but I'll mention uh, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is a very important partner for us. Um, I should also mention Martin Luther University, Helen Wittenberg, because I do have a partner of ours, and I'm sure there are a few people in the crowd. Uh, and I should also mention uh, the two partners from South Africa, the uh, uh, Stellenbosch University and the South African National Biodiversity Institute as well. That's all of us uh, at our kickoff in March. As you can see, it was a lot cooler then. Um, uh, Lisa, right in the middle there with the yellow jacket on, she's at the back there, and please do uh, talk to her about this if you're interested. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Quentin. Uh, what is the difference between a cube and a tailored space? <laughs> <laughs> Um, by switching it, I don't have the one, two questions. Yeah. From your muscle. I'm just curious about the use of the essential biodiversity variables in your project. Well, effectively, occupancy is one of the essential biodiversity. Sorry. Uh, occupancy, the species occupancy, is one of the, biodiversity, uh, the essential biodiversity variables. And yeah, we're focusing on occupancy because it's one of the low hanging fruit of the environment essential biodiversity variables. Uh, that's kind of what I meant by not being able to do everything. There are a lot of those variables that we can't speak much on. But hopefully if you manage to do it with this, we can move on to the more difficult ones in a future project. <laughs> Second question, if there is, or on, online, is it, yeah, Beate? It's, it's actually, it's not a, a question, it's more a comment. Thank you for your presentation, and I, uh, yeah, I just want to come ask, uh, tell you that uh, it's not a matter of money whether you, we are whether Germany is uh, is looking for cooperation or for shared infrastructure. So for us, it's also a very big target, or for us, it is very relevant to 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 share data, of course, and to. Uh, and to also uh, construct our data infrastructure that other can use it, it's especially in the in the region. Uh, in Leipzig, we are looking for, uh, let's say, cooperation with uh, smaller municipalities and also with uh, other public institutions to to use to to use the infrastructure we build, we develop uh, right now. Uh, yeah. I think that's what cooperative in a cooperative yeah. way. So, so uh, maybe it's a matter of money, but for us it's more a matter of um, yeah sharing the same data, being more uh, so, so, um, do, doing the more current uh, decisions, especially in the urban development, and furthermore uh, providing smaller municipalities the possibility to also uh, be able to 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 be part of an uh, ecosystem uh, of, uh, of uh, data infrastructure and uh, data. So for, of that's why your presentation was interesting for us. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, we're certainly trying to make it easy for people. Yeah. And I think it's, it, it's often the money for people and the capacity building of people that is one of the major limitations. Uh, yeah, sure, software and data is one part of that. But yeah, it's. Uh, even for my own team, is 
a big job finding the right people to do it because it's complicated and we want to decomplicate it a bit. All right. Thanks a lot. So we can continue the discussion then later uh, in the breaks. Now moving forward to another very nice project. Already the title is fine. Ferry Cube. Mm. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for uh, having the uh, possibility to discuss a little bit or present a little bit the project that I'm representing, Ferry Cubes. This stands for Fair Information Cube. So everybody in the room, I assume, will know what fair means. And yeah, we are trying to give some answers and point out some things that um, are popped up in our, in our minds in discussions over the last more than 20 years. Um, it was sitting down there is Kati Schleit on the left and myself and uh, 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 we are quite uh, uh, um, lately born new child. So Ferry Cube is like uh, approaching now the scene. We want from the biodiversity and from other groups that usually do not discuss uh, issues and topics directly with the Earth Observation Community. Uh, and, and, and we engaged in this, uh, as I said, already since 20 years. And what can we do if we know what is out there? What can you do with our data that you are not aware with? Uh, playing around. GBIF, mentioned by my prior colleague uh, Quentin, is uh, maybe in the biodiversity world and in the data world already quite well known, but there is many more uh, repositories for biodiversity data and others. And we don't know about all the services that are around in the Earth observation uh, uh, realm. So what would be possible if we could get access to all the data availabilities and uh, about knowing about all the processing uh, capacities out there in the institutions and not on the local desktops or work uh, stations that are in use. And how can, uh, what, what, what we in early uh, phases already mentioned, uh, mentioned and realized it, how can you superimpose uh, various versions of differently uh, acquired grid systems? And how can we complement those with point data? So what we produce in our um, in our museums and in our collections and biodiversity monitoring stuff is X, Y coordinate point data. How can we interact with all the grid data? What is the potential of machine learning? So all the, all the recent developments in, in machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, yeah, we are not specialists in this. And, and uh, so the consortium was built up in acquiring institutions for, for solving these questions. And Kati often uh, makes some, some funny statements. So like it's us standing outside of, of a candy store looking into the mirror and then how can we get in there and which angles do we have and where are the doors that could open us uh, yeah, these, we, uh, these sources. So the objective for Fairy Cube was from beyond basic uh, Earth observation domains, provide access and process and uh, share the grid data, algorithms and everything in a fair and trustable way. So the repositories where we put uh, all the results that we analyze and that we get on the basis of our uh, um, work, how can we put this in some, uh, in some repositories that are trustable? So long time maintenance is granted and uh, yeah, institutionalized, although federated or centralized, this is one of the topics there. Um, the machine learning, so we have one, one company in the consortium, Epsilon, in Italy, so machine learning uh, uh, components are quite important in, in this respect as well. We have also use cases, what you see is a herbarium specimen, uh, Quentin also pointed out some of the other sources, of course, uh, out there. So. Green Deal action items. What I, what I heard uh, before from the Great Project is like this, this various layers from very local up to global. This is uh, represented in our collection. So we have everything dating back more than 200 years. Uh, even pre-industrial material is, is uh, housed in our collections. Having an, an urban and regional and European focus now in this, in this Ferry Q project is um, the topic, but the, the relevance, of course, might be global. Um, 
And then what we, what we discussed initially in the, in the proposal writing phase is like that we are having some, some urban nuclei that like Barcelona or Vienna, Oslo, Luxembourg, this is uh, the consortium uh, physically uh, located in these locations and how can we combine uh, data from this. So when I see the, the estuarine uh, near Barcelona, it's like uh, we, we are diving into the UNIS uh, data and the classification of the habitat model in this in this uh, aspect, so estuarine will be then uh, maybe also selected for species composition and, and uh, there will be another session tomorrow led by Quentin where we can uh, yeah, show a little bit of what, what we selected. Um, then we have use cases, actually four, but the, the last one is divided by biodiversity use case in, is divided into two. So urban adaptation to climate change. This is one use case led by Nilo in, in Oslo. Then a special temporal assessment of neighborhood for building stock, uh, biodiversity and ag agricultural uh, nexus. This was developed by the Wageningen University. And then there's uh, two sub uh, use cases in the, from the biodiversity um, topic coming out. One is occurrence cube, so almost simple to what Quentin pointed out, but the other one was like uh, genetic variation on the basis of a model taxon, which is Prosophila melanogaster. So this is um, to having some model um, um, topics engaged in the genomic realm. This is quite, seems quite promising and the community was very excited and when they heard about our, our um, activities. Data cubes, um, so what we try to find out is now the OLAP data cubes, they are well represented in the uh, financial sector in this. So what is the difference between spatial temporal uh, data cubes and these OLAP cubes, uh, technically speaking, uh, speaking and uh, content wise? And um, what, uh, which dimensions should we add into, into our spatial temporal uh, data cubes like a species or a taxa and Synonyms, so one uh, plant or one animal can be called by different uh, scientists with different uh, um, scientific names. There is services out there. Genomic variants, what are the variables and how, they, how uh, are they reacting to climate change or environmental factors and others which we even don't, might not know. And land cover types, of course. So what is the cross-domain issue stack? This is really an important thing we are discussing. So we're bringing together many people from very different domains and skill sets, and uh, we are not talking about the same stuff in the same language. So we understand different things when, you're talking, when we're using the same words. CRS stands for Coordinate Reference System. We recently found out that even the metadata for the world CLIM data does not give the information about the coordinate reference systems. And we've been contacting two days ago, or three days ago, actually last week, several, uh, several colleagues out there globally. And so we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, instantly link those data because we don't know the reference systems. Grids, you see some of the, some of the topics there. Um, domain access, what is a domain and what is a fact, uh, sorry, what is a, uh, dimension and what is effect. This is a big discussion going on in, in, in between our group. Um, and then AI machine learning uh, approaches, a different topic, resource requirements. So when we have in the proposal writing phase had to tell two companies that are joining uh, or that joined in the uh, consortium, what processing uh, power do you need? We said, mm, we don't know from our end. What storage do you need for the data that you produce? We also did not know, so we had to calculate this. And when I see the great project, this is like maybe even also a challenge on uh, European or global level. One of the main products of the FerryCube project will be a FerryCube hub, so where we integrate workflows and products out of, uh, sorry, and data processing and uh, uh, all this uh, from all the various domains that you see. Uh, it should be a cross-cutting platform, but we experience is some, some details like how to integrate in uh, raster data management systems, how to integrate uh, Python processing um, infrastructures that are used by the scientific community. We will have a knowledge base to capture diverse issues, reducing confusion or uh, helping to solve confusion. 
and the technical readiness level that we want to achieve uh, should be uh, seven, so quite should be quite mature in the end. Project details. This is uh, funded by the Commission. Started last year in uh, July. We have uh, eight partners, and yeah, this is the list of the partners. Nilo is coordinating. This is the Norwegian Institute for Luftuntersuchung. I don't know. So L and U means air investigation. Force Fera and Space for Environment um, are in the in the realm of the uh, Earth observation side. Eox and uh, uh, Rastaman uh, companies, Epsilon Italia is doing the machine learning part, Wageningen University and NHM in Vienna. I'm representing myself. That was it. I won't click. Th thanks. thanks a lot. And, that, and then, now I don't know how to set it up. That there is a remote uh, presentation, but we are, can have one or two questions. I'm sure there are. Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And we love, I, I'm not a fan of candy, but I, I fully understand the, the metaphor. I had a question regarding the connection with uh, EOSC. Uh -huh. You have any collaboration? Do you see, because if you want to provide um, a marketplace or a, a hub, in principle, EOSC is supposed to facilitated access to all kind of research data. So how do you see the complementarities or the shortcoming on EOSC side where you can bring a, a uniqueness or added value? Yeah, I'm currently a management board uh, member of the EOSC support office in Austria. So we have this connection with EOSC and we we'll see what's out there and what's on the marketplace of EOSC, of course, that's clear. But um, there's also in institutions, including my own institution, which are not part of the academic world. So we are a research performing organization, and this is not directly linked to EOSC, but we produce many data. So uh, there's many aspects also, and, but there is connections to EOSC, of course. Yeah. And we will provide services that can be interlinked with EOSC and like, put on the marketplace or where, where, wherever it will be. So, like the the ferry cube hub could like contribute to to ask, of course. Um, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, only a short question: Did you use um, the RDF data cube vocabulary to? Um, enrich your data cubes or maybe to semantically and, um, represent the data cubes uh, in your project? This is, um, what we at the moment are doing is like investigating all the possible workflows that we can implement. And this is one of the aspects that are, I'm not a technical guy, so I'm a biodiversity guy, I'm a biologist myself. And um, so, so this question, I, tackled by Kati and by Stefan, the coordinator and the technical advisor, or technical head. And um, I can really not answer your question then. No, other so, than um, I could highly recommend it to do it, uh -huh. though, because um, if, you, if you represent the data cube with RDF data cube vocabulary um, and to um, publish it uh, using the data, uh, the linked data principles, mm -hmm. then your data cube becomes automatically a fair um, data set, and um, there you can mix as well um, uh, dimensions, domain-specific dimension, temporal, geographical dimensions, and so on and so forth. So we did it in the past, and it was, from my point of view, quite successful. So only as a small comment. Very good input, then, in this case. Yes, thanks. Okay, then let's move forward. We have a remote presentation now. I think the technicians are setting that up. Um, and then the... Um, we already touched quite a lot of issues uh, or the thematics where we have dedicated sessions for that. So there will be an EOSC session in the afternoon, there will be a biodiversity session tomorrow afternoon. Um, we will have an entire day on semantics, which has been now a topic for, for several, uh, in several moments. And uh, all right, so we are set up for the usage presentation. Lucia. Yes, we can hear you, and your okay. uh, presentation is up, so the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to apologize for not being able to be there in person, uh, but due to some last minute, I have not been able to travel. 
but I also wanted to thank the students and the organizers who have given us the, the chance to participate in this session with me support and support. So, well, my name is Lucia Sánchez González. I'm a PhD student from the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. And uh, I'm going to talk about the usage, the project usage that refers to the urban data space for the Green Deal. So, as we all know, the European Commission has established the, the target through the Green Deal to make Europe the first climate neutral uh, continent by the year 2050. And uh, to reach this goal, the key uh, is um, focused by the cities and the towns to implement this Green Deal uh, through what is called a local Green Deal. Within this deal, the local governments, together with local businesses, stakeholders, civil society, agreed to a series of initiatives that will support the city's sustainability goals. But to reach this goal, to do so, cities need to incorporate data into their policies mechanisms to leverage um, quality data that will support the uh, decision-making um, processes. And here is where the urban data spaces uh, have an important role. So our project arose with the idea of implementing the, um, the European strategy for data together with the uh, European Green Deal initiatives uh, where the climate change is mostly full, which are the, the cities and the towns. So the goal of usage is to overcome these legal and technical barriers to share and exploit this uh, urban data that is needed for the local Green Deal among the public sector, private organizations and the civil society. So our project pretends to, to provide artificial intelligent tools and, and, process, and processes, uh, consolidated arrangements, innovative governance mechanisms and models, and also data analytics that allows to assess, use and, and share data that comes from Earth observation, Internet of Things and uh, authoritative and cloud sources, leveraging on standards for data and service interoperability. So, Right now, I'm going to talk about the consortium at the beginning because I wanted to, to remark that inside our consortium, there is uh, 12 interdisciplinary partners that uh, come from the, the industry and small, um, medium enterprises and large uh, companies. Also, we have academia and research groups that have a lot of experience in, in, in project for open data uh, with private and public and, uh, organizations. We also have a standardization organizations such as the OGC itself. And we also have in our consortium local governments from the areas where our, our uh, project will be um, deployed. So right now, uh, we have, as I said before, we have uh, four pilot uh, cities for front, uh, four uh, countries that are small and medium European cities. And these are Ferrara from Italy, Graz from Austria, Leven for Belgium and Zaragoza for Spain. So, as I just mentioned before, there are two municipalities that are uh, directly involved in our consortium, which are the municipality of Ferrara and the municipality of Zaragoza. And the uh, city of Leven is represented by the QB, uh, Q, uh, KG Leven uh, University. And the city of Graz is represented in our project um, through the company ABT. And although we are now focusing in these four pilot cities, our project also pretends to, to make a, a data shared infrastructure to, to improve the, the knowledge and to, to help to establish the local green deals in these cities, but also creating uh, resources that will allow to, uh, the replicability of our results in another European cities in the future. So uh, this will be a review of our um, the methodological approach we are following in our project, and it focuses in five key uh, interconnected elements. So the first element uh, focuses on identifying the real world scenario and the use cases that characterize our four pilot cities. So we need to understand which are the, the material resources that the, the cities already have and need, what is the requirements regarding the climate change that the cities want to approach, and also uh, who are the stakeholders that uh, are needed for the urban data space in these uh, pilot cities. Our second element uh, focus on collecting uh, and checking the available data that the, that the cities already have, and which is the, the city, the, the data, sorry, that uh, they need from our project. And all, of course, all of this taking in mind the, the fair principles, our third element focus on the conversion between the, the local uh, situation of the data in these uh, cities towards the urban data space. 
using um, standard-based data models and also APIs. Our fourth element uh, concentrates in the development of tools and technological solutions to obtain a, a analysis a ready de, a data and decision-ready information. And our fifth element uh, focus on um, trying to connect these technological and tool solutions that we, we are developing in our project with the policy mechanisms and, and needed from and needs from the from the cities. In this element, we also uh, are aborting uh, how to share the lessons we learn uh, with our project and also how to uh, promote the replicability of our results in the other European cities for the future. So much of the work we have done so far in the project was focused on, on performing a challenge system maps in which we have done a series of interviews to a, a group of people from the pilot cities that have important roles regarding that data policy, green policy, IT experts, urban planning managers, etc. And with these interviews, we try to identify which are the city's main challenges regarding the climate change, which is the data and the tools uh, existing uh, inside these cities, what are the initiatives and the, and the policies they are carrying out right now and uh, or will carry out, and uh, of course, identify the potential st uh, stakeholders that will be involved or could be involved in this urban data space. Also, another major effort uh, that we have done is to try to identify for the Green Deal um, policy areas, which are considered as a high priority for the pilot cities. And we have identified that the pilot cities want to focus on climate change action, air quality, biodiversity, and mobility. And for these areas, we also have identified or are still identifying a series of use cases from which um, our project usage can add on. So one example of these use cases that is common for all the pilot cities is the mitigation of urban heat islands. And just to show you an example, uh, the, um, in the city of Ferrara, once from used to uh, obtain a web service or QGIS plugin that is based on an algorithm that will evaluate the variation of this heat uh, island index. And this will allow the technicians and the decision makers to uh, identify this hot spot, uh, hot spot sorry, uh, within the urban area of Ferrara and um, support them in taking decisions to mitigate these uh, urban heat islands. Also, finally, I wanted to, to tell you what are the, the other tasks that we will carry out in the near future or still carry out right now. Um, we are focusing now in understanding which are the necessary ingredients for the data spaces that will satisfy the needs uh, from the pilot cities. Also, we are now collecting the existing data and collecting and adjust also the tools that are needed for handling the new data that will come in our project. Also trying to identify and define what are the required standard-based data models, formats, and APIs that are needed to ensure this interoperability uh, within the data space. And the final point is that we are trying to figure out how to validate um, this urban data space for the Green Deal. Um, that could be all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Lucia. So then for her dedicated, are there any questions? One, two questions, Helge? Thank you, Lucia. I very much like that you start with the real world and not with data. Uh, that is a very good approach, I think. It's very often a very good approach. Now, having said that, you have your project in Zaragoza and you try to integrate the citizens uh, in your project. Mm -hmm. How do you do that and what is the reaction of most of these citizens? Okay, so um, right now we uh, actually have in a couple of the cities, the Bali cities, specifically in Ferrara and Leuven, uh, had some events where uh, um, a couple well, a group of citizens have invited to the event. Sorry, do you hear me well? Uh, yes, we, we, we can hear you, but the sound is a bit... Okay, sorry, sorry. sorry. You, you... Um, so, yes, we, a couple of things uh, we have done, a couple of things where we have invited uh, citizens from the schools and they can uh, for example, to, to map the... Uh, 
challenges of the possible data uh, challenges that is so, uh, so we have uh, uh, prepared and organized, and um, also for the near future, a couple of events where the citizens will, will actually be involved. I don't know if it has answered your question. You, you want to you wanna request something? Or is it, no? Okay. Right. I think that the answer was fair enough. So it's a bit difficult to understand you because the sound is uh, not the best quality. <laughs> that's always I'm sorry. The no, that's not your fault. <laughs> that's here the technicians. Yeah, Mark, there is another question. And we can also open up the questions to all the other uh, speakers. We have another couple of minutes to discuss now the entire session. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, Mark Dietrich from the Great Project. Um, my question is whether. Uh, kind of two flavors of this question. First, are you uh, working or interacting at all with the data spaces for, I think it's smart society and smart cities, which is one of the other preparatory actions that the Digital Europe program has funded. And the second is issue is, uh, is there a common inventory of all the smart city urban pilots uh, that are being conducted? I've, I think in the last two weeks, I've heard probably 25 of these going on, and it would be really great to bring these together and to start sharing and comparing what the requirements are and, and how these might be solved by data spaces. But the narrow question is whether you're working with uh, the folks at DS4SSSC. Yes, so I actually am not quite sure of this. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to check with the various of the partners. But I'm, 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 I think that, yes, we, we have talked and we have to share. And we are we having them really in our in our project and um of course wanted to to collaborate and and, and have their what they are doing in uh, bringing that to the to our project and to uh, responding to your second question um so we actually have uh, are developing a web cap, uh, catalog for for metadata for the data and the and the tools and harvesting for the data portals of the of these pilot cities uh, it's still a bit difficult because uh, there are some cities such as Leven that doesn't have a, a data catalog but yes we are working in a in a to try to to create and unified a, a web a catalog yeah be uh, something interesting for uh, the city of Leipzig and that to be included and that um I don't know, Beate, you would like to correspond? Yeah, I mean, all these uh, presentations are interesting for us, of course, because um, Leipzig is part of the uh, EU mission, um, Clima Neutral and Smart Cities until 2030. As you maybe recognize, our mayor, Mr. Schulke, he mentioned 2040 as, uh, as target uh, year, but uh, at the same time, we, we are uh, in this mission. We try to find ways to be to be to to reach the clima, climate neutrality uh, earlier, especially also with the help of data and data infrastructure. And uh, regarding this, we, of course, for us, it's quite interesting uh, to hear how data spaces are uh, developed in your research institutes and um, how. Um, how you use data, uh, especially also in context of the Green Deal, and so on and so on. So for, for this, uh, regarding this, I don't have a uh, concrete question to you, Lucia, but thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Right, there plenty of opportunities to exchange afterwards, and, then, and we will have a dedicated session, or after, after lunch break, then there are three keynotes uh, for the divisions for the European uh, Commission and then also the possibilities, technical possibilities and challenges, as well as also a keynote for biodiversity. So that's kind of we're wrapping up all the, the, the topics that we are having here. We have another 10 minutes to discuss. So the floor is open for questions in general. Or if there's anything uh, online, then please let me know. Right. <coughs> Thank you.
Yeah, I have a very general question to any of the projects. What about the business models for data sharing? Who's going to finance the data sh space infrastructure, the connectors, etc.? Does any project has a, a task assignment there? And probably, hopefully, news. Who is going to answer that? For sure. <laughs> So uh, thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, certainly within the GREAT project, uh, in the work package where we're focusing on governance, we're also looking at business models. Uh, so that's an explicit discussion. We, we have several business models that we need to worry about. The first is the, the business model for the data space as a whole, because it's not going to be free. Uh, it will cost money to, to make it work, even if there is no processing or storage. Um, there's efforts required for that. So what is the sustainability plan for that? The second layer is when you have participants in the data space who are in business to sell or provide their data for profit. And we ha are talking with a number of companies for whom this is an objective. And so they, they are coexisting or sitting next to public sector bodies who are providing data for free. So how do we bring these pieces together? So that's a challenge for the GREAT project. I would give you an example from another data space, agricultural data space, where their objective is to bring activities together which are from different countries, Germany, Belgium, uh, France, et cetera, where the business model of the whole data space is entirely different. In one case, it's fully paid for by the government and it's a, it's a free product. In another case, it's a pay for use, pay per use on the part of each farmer who is participating, each uh, data consumer who is participating. So entirely uh, different and almost incompatible business models. So they're struggling with how to bring those pieces together. So it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, and as a final uh, flavor on this, there's the question of uh, what is the organizational structure for data spaces? So one thing that has been proposed by the European Union, the European Commission, is the European Data Infrastructure Consortium, an EDIC, which is uh, a, a, a supposed to be essentially a multi-country project, uh, majority funded by the member states who are participating in the EDIC, so then the question is, is, what is the sustainability model for that? Is it permanently attached to these member states for budget, or is there some mechanism that will allow it to become sustaining? Uh, we had a presentation by one organization in Luleå, Sweden, which was talking about in Data Week, where they said specifically, we want to be sustainable. Uh, at the same time, uh, they want to, so they wanted to propose common services to, for, pe for purchase to make money, and then they also wanted to build companies who would, uh, SMEs and, and startups and so on, who would build around the data and, and build their own business models around the data. But, but they are in competition. So the EDIC would be competing with the exact uh, organizations that it wants to create. So it's a hard question. And so just to <laughs> simplify it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic question, and uh, please do come along to the biodiversity session tomorrow <laughs> to, to discuss it further. Um, I'd just like to point out uh, there was a report by uh, Deloitte uh, just out today on the uh, benefits to society from GBIF. And for every one euro uh, invested in GBIF by the governments, uh, they get three euros back and 12 euros to the greater society. Uh, it, it comes down to who, who pays for our roads. Um, we're making infrastructure, and sometimes there has to be common uh, money put into it. Uh, but I also say that one thing that may not come up in this community that is important to think about is the, the historical legacy of Europe to the rest of the world, the way we've exploited the rest of the world in our colonialism and things like this, and certainly uh, coming from a, a herbarium and a museum uh, that has being part of that, we do have a responsibility uh, to the rest of the world also to help those other countries that we've so long exploited uh, to make sure that we um, help them preserve their biodiversity, which in general is much greater than our own. You want to respond? There is a microphone on that side. <laughs> no, if you don't want. Thanks a lot for the, the, answer, the, the answer, the question and the answer. Any further question? Another five minutes to go. Yes, Valentin. 
Thanks. Um, um, it, it's more like a challenging question that uh, how do we make sure that these data spaces that are created are not becoming another silos by themselves with the existing scattered data sources because um, the, there should be like uh, in some data spaces some um, initiatives there were like maybe three cities or four cities it's not scalable if, if it's not global for for businesses at least so that's kind of a challenge yeah that's a fair question that and uh, there's a lot of experience already on that we were trying kind of how to build up the, the data spaces in inspire for example yeah John I believe all, all these things are efforts to make data and services open uh, and if we use this philosophy of the building blocks, the same building block can be attached to different of these infrastructures. You can call it data space, you can call it special data infrastructure, you can call it Inspire. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, the same services that were used for Inspire will, in principle, be useful for, for connected to the Green Deal data space. We, we aim more about the, the new APIs because that fits better with the IT, but more or less it will, it will work, and uh, the same standards are uh, reused in the European Open Science Cloud and uh, most probably in Gaia X2. So I, I believe we, the, the efforts are how uh, legitimous in the sense that every, every, oh, each one of these efforts go into that direction. The question is, are we going to achieve this, uh, the, this goal of everything completely connected, super easy, uh, with semantics, press a button, get the result? That's a different, that's a different question. Is it a good, good answer for you? <laughs> well, you have the entire week to discuss that further. And then also there's the publication of a uh, kind of thinking further with that. All right. Any further questions or comments? Is there anything online if I can't see that? No. If that's not the case, then thanks a lot for all the speakers. A uh, warm uh, round of applause for them. <laughs> for online. We are now having a lunch break. Lunch is outside, and uh, there is then also the possibility to discuss further. And then after lunch, we will have a session with keynotes and the presentation of uh, the uh, GOA3 project and the discussion. All right, thanks a lot and see you after lunch.
few technical issues, but that's the normal procedure. <laughs> All right. We have now three keynotes, uh, starting with the vision of the European Commission, the European Commission, or the European vision, that how we are kind of moving forward and that towards a digital transi tran transition. And uh, that's going to be the baseline of all, all our di upcoming discussions. So what is a data space actually? What does the European Commission wants? Uh, we already had a lot of discussions in the morning towards Green Deal and uh, um, many uh, topics left and right. And that if, is that possible? And that how can we do it, et cetera, et cetera. Now then it's going to have that. And then afterwards we are following with uh, special um, topic on biodiversity, that how is the Green Deal or data space looking like, and that if we are filling that with biodiversity data. And then afterwards we have the third one about the technique, that telling that is that possible, is that not possible, where are the challenges, where are the gaps, and where do we need to fiddle around and find new recipes and to organize and bring all these visions in place. And I'm welcoming Jordi from the European Commission and the floor is yours. Thank you, Nis. Thank you, Nils, and uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. So I will try to uh, explain the, the perspective from the European Commission uh, on the Green Deal data space, and in particular, all this uh, 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 horizontal legislation that uh, aims to uh, build all these uh, European common data spaces. So, now. so uh, why we are here all together um, today and for, for the rest of the week, we, we want to discuss about uh, how to make things better. So. I, I was just uh, remembering the last question on the on the last session uh, about, uh, but we will be able to, to uh, um, let's say, uh, improve what uh, the SDIs uh, have been achieving during the last year. So, uh, and I I also uh, heard the, uh, an answer to, to this question, stating that uh, we we all know which are the objectives and. Uh, and uh, we will try to make it better. So uh, this is the main message. But uh, now what, uh, what we are here is to uh, respond to some uh, uh, needs from, from this uh, European digital society. Uh, and uh, we have to take uh, tackle uh, many of the problems of, of this society. We want to tackle them with data. Uh, we have uh, challenges regarding uh, the environment, uh, energy consumption, uh, how to become uh, carbon neutral in, in our economies. Uh, we want to, at the same time, foster innovation and co competitiveness. Uh, so uh, what we are willing to, to do is to uh, develop these uh, uh, data spaces, uh, common European data spaces, for responding to such kind of things. And uh, for this, uh, we, uh, the European Commission, the current European Commission, uh, has uh, six uh, key priorities. And uh, today, uh, we will be focusing on two of them. Uh, one, which is, we could uh, say, li I like the, the twin green and digital transition. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, uh, we want to develop a European Green Deal uh, and also uh, a Europe fit for, for a digital age. So, uh, and uh, all, all these uh, priorities of the Commission are in line of responding to the questions uh, and, and challenges that we have uh, pre pre previously mentioned. Uh, how we want to achieve this? So, uh, we want to achieve this uh, or vehiculate uh, this uh, through the European Strategy for Data. Uh, which uh, aims uh, really at uh, creating a European single market for data. Uh, you can uh, have a look at the, at the document, uh, at the legal documents establishing uh, this uh, strategy, but uh, here the, the main aspects uh, and the main problems to be addressed is to 
uh, again, uh, like like uh, European SDI, uh, uh, the European SDI is to make data available, uh, push for uh, interoperability and quality, but uh, also to the governance uh, uh, aspects uh, of this uh, data sharing and, and the uh, technical aspects of the infrastructures, but uh, going ahead also to uh, uh, pushing for improving the, the digital skills, the data literacy from, from, from uh, the members, the, from our citizens, uh, dealing with cybersecurity, which is a big concern nowadays, uh, and uh, the final aim, so th these are the prob problems to be tackled that are, are quite similar to those that we had uh, ten, 10 years ago, maybe updated with some more complexity, but uh, now uh, we want to achieve these uh, uh, sectoral data spaces to be used in different domains to uh, uh, tackle all these so so societal uh, challenges. Uh, and uh, this uh, European strategy for data is mainly vehiculated and, and translated into, into legal acts, uh, four main legal acts that uh, we will be commenting now. Uh, first of all, the Data Governance Act, which uh, aims uh, uh, at making uh, voluntary data available in, in this uh, market for data, uh, which means uh, uh, on one side, uh, sharing this information through some basic interoperability aspects that uh, needs to be uh, uh, achieved, but mainly building trust, because uh, otherwise these actors that have, have to share data uh, will not be uh, probably willing uh, to, to share this data. And this is uh, affecting pub public sector, the business, uh, individuals, researchers, uh, everybody. Uh, the second uh, uh, legal act is the Digital Markets Act, which uh, uh, is uh, tackling this, uh, we all, all of us have data uh, pushed in one servers in the internet and there, there are these big pla platforms where uh, they are having our data and uh, have a lot of power. So this, this Digital Market Act uh, uh, is aimed uh, first uh, uh, at assuring these practices by, by these uh, big platforms or gate picker, uh, gate uh, keepers, uh, and uh, also to assure that uh, we as citizens can move our personal data from uh, one platform to another without any uh, any issues. So this is kind of limitation the limitating limitating the, the, the power that these uh, gatekeepers has in in the market and uh, a very important one which will be focusing uh, uh, more uh, in the in some of the next slides is the open data and the implementing act on high value data sets which which is uh, pursuing this legal act is, is to increase data availability and access uh, because it's not enough uh, and uh, and reduce the heterogeneity in the licenses which are currently used for sharing this data. This is mainly affecting public sector and it's uh, really uh, a, a push, a political push for making uh, these high value data sets which are data which are data sets which are considered uh, key for, for this uh, for building uh, and providing this data fuel to, to these uh, European data spaces for free and uh, in open license formats. And finally, the, the Data Act, which uh, is uh, uh, affecting the business, the private sector, and uh, uh, which uh, is aimed to increase uh, data availability to foster innovation, and, and also uh, assure that uh, the access to, to and use of data is fair. And uh, uh, there, there are also some incentives uh, to uh, data generation. And uh, uh, we mentioned this uh, Open Data Act and the Implementing Act on high value data sets. Uh, first of all, the concept of this high value data sets is to uh, those data sets that uh, the reuse of which uh, 
uh, are associated to important uh, socioeconomic benefits for this digital society and this uh, uh, digital market. Uh, and uh, as we already said, uh, uh, the data sets which fall under these uh, 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 special categories of uh, high value data sets shall be available uh, from member states uh, for, for free under open license. Uh, currently, the CC BY uh, 4.0 or less restrictive. Uh, main important as well in machine, on, machine readable formats through uh, the use of APIs uh, and were relevant with uh, bulk downloads as well. Uh, we have six uh, high value data set categories the geospatial, earth observation and environment, uh, meteorological, uh, statistics, uh, companies and company ownership, and mobility. And uh, finally, uh, uh, this uh, implementing act that I mentioned, what is really defining is uh, the list of these uh, high value data sets categories and providing some requirements uh, for each of, of these categories uh, that member states should, uh, shall, shall comply with in, in their data provision. Uh, these are mainly key attributes, also granularity of this data, uh, the different formats, the license, etc. Uh, now I, I'm returning maybe to the to the present, uh, also the the past, but uh, also the future. So uh, uh, we are talking today uh, about the Green Deal data space, but uh, we should not forget that uh, the origins of the Green Deal data space are the Inspire Directive, which uh, aim at the at the establishing a European special data infrastructure for Europe. And uh, the implementation of this directive uh, had been partially uh, successful, which means that uh, there were some challenges that uh, were not achieved at the moment uh, and stay in this uh, uh, current market uh, to be solved. So, uh, the current vision for, for the evolution of the INSPIRE Directive is uh, specifically going to this European uh, Green Deal data space, which, which is the evolution of, uh, to a data ecosystem, uh, where uh, we are broadening the scope that there is no, no more only the public sector, but also the private businesses, the academia, uh, new communities, uh, developers, and more importantly, the users, which is, were probably the, the actors that uh, were not really involved in the implementation of the INSPIRE Directive. Uh, and uh, on the horizon of this evolution, uh, we have to, uh, uh, let's say, adapt uh, what we have now, trying to make it better. Uh, an important thing is to make things simple, uh, simple, uh, in terms of interoperability, so uh, the experience uh, show us that uh, complex things are not working well, so maybe we have to be less restrictive on these interoperability requirements and trying to uh, get the data integrated in order to build something else that could be used by the user. So uh, there is an important uh, uh, step forward uh, in, in our challenge now to adopt this, uh, uh, well, uh, these emerging technologies and the standards. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the context uh, about the uh, INSPIRE directive. So uh, what's the, 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 the vision for, for this European common data spaces is to build these uh, sectoral data spaces which shall be uh, uh, communicating in, in each other in order to in order to share data, share uh, also common common elements for interoperability, common solutions, uh, be fitted with these uh, high value data sets, uh, uh, and also uh, the, the personal data spaces where uh, we, uh, the, the information from citizens, personal information can be shared and controlled with, uh, uh, with care uh, in, in all these contexts. So, uh, one of the key elements in this uh, 
uh, building of uh, the European data spaces is to uh, tackle the, the techno new technology trends that uh, we are we are now we have now available, which are, for example, the Internet of Things, Copernicus, the citizen-generated data, also private data from businesses, uh, open uh, data from research activities, etc. Uh, about technology trends, uh, the, the, the push is to uh, use, uh, make s extensive use of uh, OGC, uh, uh, the APIs, uh, mainly from OGC, and uh, uh, international standardization, uh, use of agile, and ma agile standards, mature tools, which proves to be uh, in, in use by the communities and to be uh, in implementing all these uh, standards and uh, the uh, research on these novel architectures for data sharing. And uh, here uh, we have, uh, talking about the, the research activities that the Joint Research Center from the European Commission is doing, is uh, uh, research on, on how this uh, European data space should look like. And uh, as a basis of this analysis, uh, there were a previous work on analysis on uh, data sharing initiatives existing uh, where you can see different elements here that uh, were taken into account and all, all this uh, were, was mapped uh, to uh, uh, analysis of technical and non-technical requirements for uh, the shaping of data spaces uh, which uh, have been translated into different uh, uh, reports uh, mm, published by GRC or with collaborations from, from other other actors as well. But today we are uh, presenting uh, here this new report on uh, European data spaces, which uh, have been brand uh, uh, new published uh, uh, in two weeks, I think. And uh, the, 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 the main, uh, the main, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, science for policy report is uh, providing uh, a scientific insights on uh, into uh, how this data sharing and utilization in, into data spaces should look like uh, or could look like because it's a, a work in progress how, how to define all this data sharing. Uh, uh, comment about this uh, concept of data spaces and uh, the idea is to uh, become an easy entry point for, for this concept of data spaces, trying to respond questions, uh, trying to uh, find, uh, identify uh, possible candidates uh, uh, on, on different aspects, on technical standards, on, on uh, data governance uh, uh, um, approaches that could help in, in deploying this, uh, this uh, European data spaces. So, as I said, the ingredients for this report are the di different findings from, from articles, reports on, on data sharing, and uh, the, these uh, technical and non-technical requirements that, uh, that uh, were uh, extracted from, from the European strategy for data. Uh, this report is not only from GSC, so it's co-created uh, with different services from the European Commission and uh, have been also validated uh, by them. So uh, we can see here DG Environment, DG Sante, DG Go, Digit, uh, uh, of course GSC, but also DG Agri and Connect. So uh, apart from this uh, report, there are two, two products derived from them. Uh, uh, from the same knowledge that uh, is a wiki document, which is uh, uh, it's intended to be an open document where uh, we all can uh, in provide input uh, as, as the, this uh, work on the European data spaces is progressing, and also an interactive uh, component chatbot for question and answer uh, uh, system. So, uh, all this uh, uh, work on this technical report, uh, science uh, for policy report, uh, should be contributing to the work on, uh, of the Data Spaces Support Center and the European Innovation Board. This is one of the elements for, from the, from the uh, 
uh, which was uh, developed in, in the context of this, uh, of this report, which is uh, uh, a dashboard where the, you can directly browse uh, the different uh, uh, collections of reports, etc., related to European data spaces, and you can filter, uh, mm, try to find the answers to your questions, etc. So, uh, and uh, um, in the in the report itself, you can also find uh, kind of fact sheets which uh, are the. Uh, explaining how to uh, uh, in, in the uh, answering questions on how to develop uh, uh, different aspects of data spaces, for example, which standards to be used for for data sharing, for metadata. I don't know for for uh, uh, pro promoting uh, promoting uh, this uh, data altruism, things like that. So. Uh, the, the intention is to uh, have this uh, easy entry point for, for all these aspects. Apart from, from this uh, report on European data spaces, we are also working in uh, uh, parallel uh, studies, uh, which are, are intended to support the Green Data for All initiative. Uh, maybe some of you, do, you don't know about this initiative, but this uh, the, the revision of the INSPIRE directive. So, there is, for example, uh, uh, a study about the possible role of data intermediaries, which uh, should play a, a role in this uh, Green Deal data space. Uh, also, uh, the options for including citizen science and, and user consent data, uh, which is this the data altruism mechanism that, that we can use in order to provide even more data to these data spaces. And uh, also, uh, how, how to uh, review the interoperability provisions that are currently uh, defined, for example, in the INSPIRE directive. How, how, what's the next step and uh, where we should go? Uh, uh, and uh, talking more about this uh, uh, Green Data for All initiative and the re revision of the INSPIRE directive, we have also recently published uh, the vision from GSC, which is a GSC policy brief. It's a document of three, four, four pages, where we uh, provide an, ishi, an initial reflection on the possible legal intervention, inter interventions that uh, could f facilitate uh, the, establish the establishment of the European Green Deal data space. So this is uh, uh, an input, uh, especially to be taken into account for DG environment, which will be finally designing which is the best uh, approach for for shaping this uh, Green Deal data space. Uh, we have mentioned about uh, policy reports, uh, uh, research activities, et cetera, but uh, we are now approaching the next step, which is building these data spaces. Uh, and uh, in the first uh, session, we have also had some presentations about uh, different projects, uh, which uh, some of them are coordination and support actions, which are uh, 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 projects that are uh, um, funded by the European Commission in order to make a specific uh, um, or achieve a specific elements of these uh, green data spaces. Uh, first of all is the data spaces super center, which uh, whose mission is to coordinate all these relevant uh, actions on sectoral data spaces. Uh, and we'll be providing a blueprint, uh, best practices, uh, common standards, support activities, knowledge transfer, etc., to be uh, reused in sectoral uh, coordination support actions, like, for example, uh, the, the green, uh, the great project, uh, which is the coordinate support action for, for the, for the uh, development of the, of the Green Deal data space. Uh, each of these uh, sectoral coordination and support actions uh, have a specific mission to coordinate each of the specific sectoral data spaces, and each of them uh, have to provide a community of practice, uh, work on a list of priority data sets for, for this uh, sectoral data space, uh, have to deal as well with this uh, engagement of stakeholders, the governance of business models, and the roadmap. So, uh, and uh, on top of this, we will have the coordination of this European Data Innovation Board, uh, the EDIP, uh, which will be set up uh, in September this year. 
uh, whose mission uh, would be to, uh, yes, more or less consultive and advis advisory body, uh, which is established by the, by the Data Governance Act. Uh, we mentioned about the Data Spaces Super Center, but uh, I guess that uh, you already had some information on this. Uh, uh, in the presentation from, from, from Great, for example, this morning, so I will uh, skip this one. And uh, uh, the, 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 green, the Great project itself, so uh, which uh, will be establishing the, the, the foundations for, for uh, developing this uh, Green Deal data space. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this uh, project, is, uh, this coordination and support action is funded by the Digital Euro Program. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, this, uh, each of, of these uh, actions are, uh, in a short time frame, should deliver a specific uh, elements, uh, like for example, for the great project, uh, an inventory of this uh, uh, Green Deal data space, uh, data and services, uh, the catalog of, of technic, uh, technical and interoperability requirements, uh, the governance schemes, the, the blueprint, uh, and a roadmap for, for the implementation of, of the uh, data space itself. So, uh, and finally, uh, since uh, I know that today uh, we have a, an important presence here about the, the uh, smart cities and the local communities, uh, I just provided some thoughts uh, about uh, the role of cities and smart cities in this context. So first of all, uh, the cities are uh, a geographic space where uh, both data and circular economy should coexist. And uh, of course, there are high pressures on this environment. Uh, at the same time, are spaces where uh, uh, most part of the population is concentrated, and uh, uh, it's uh, a space which is subject to constant change and evolution. So we need near to on the fly uh, data capture, management, and analysis. Uh, here it comes the the concept of digital twin, and. Uh, uh, regarding the smart cities, uh, yeah, uh, data collection is everywhere. So data is increasingly collected in different environments. Uh, it's uh, often collected with high granularity uh, and uh, resolution, uh, big data in some cases, and uh, uh, input uh, for simulations and digital twins serving uh, these key uh, Green Deal use cases is, is uh, one of the topics, uh, especially in cities. And uh, data availability and accessibility for the provision of these uh, digital services for citizens is, is one of the main uh, aspects to be achieved. Just to finalize, the, which would be some uh, high level recipes for, for this uh, integrating cities data into the European data spaces and partic particularly the Green Deal. Uh, first of all, uh, as any other kind of actor participating in the, in the uh, data spaces, there would be a need to gradually build capacities uh, and adopt emerging technolo technologies and standards for data spaces. Uh, also, if, if possible, closely follow up this coordination and support actions that are in place, uh, which could be a possibility to try to collaborate in, in such areas because they are really willing to have information about real use cases and uh, participate and influence in these relevant actions. Like for example, there is this uh, OASC work defining the minimum interoperability requirements. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, go beyond the open data directive, uh, applying this uh, open licensing framework when possible and make uh, Haybelly data sets freely available through uh, uh, standard APIs. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you if I was a bit long. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jordi, for this uh, great overview on the, the visions and what you're expecting us to do <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the future. Um, while we are fiddling uh, the next uh, presentation on, and that we can have one or two questions. Is there anything in the room? Uh, 
Hi, Jordy. Hi. Thank you. I think we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few things on your slides that I didn't didn't know existed. So uh, uh, anyway, I'm hoping we can we can chat about that. But uh, from the I'm obviously with the great Green Deal data space. One particular question: there was a small, quick statement in one of your slides that talked about uh, providing data, but also processing and storage. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, you know, how this should work. Uh, it's, it's a common question. Um, many people are struggling with this, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how you see this happening in data spaces or next to data spaces. Okay, so really I didn't know. <laughs> so of course, uh, it, the, the, there is a challenge. So uh, one of the key experience from, from the implementation, for example, of the Inspire Directive is to, uh, we use in that case as the, the traditional OGC services, which, uh, yeah, uh, were uh, aimed at uh, access the information at source. Uh, and of course, the, there are these limitations on uh, how much the data, how much data you can transfer, the time you, you can, uh, you need to, to, to get all this data. So uh, how this could be improved in European data spaces. So, uh, and uh, we are now also uh, involving a lot of different actors, not only data providers, uh, where we have in the past and then we push all this information in a catalog and uh, the user were uh, magically going there <laughs> to, to, ta to take this data and try to use it, but uh, this uh, rarely happened. This is the problem and this is what we should, uh, in my view, uh, all this exchange of data uh, and access processing data in most of, of cases, especially for cases where we have big data, this would not be possible on the fly. So I, I think that the, uh, some, somehow we should think about technical means of how this data exchange for, for a specific use cases, for a specific data spaces, for uh, taking information from, from from data providers in one data space or taking data from, from another data space could be somehow integrated uh, into a kind of temporal storage where we can really exploit the data for a certain purpose in a, in a let's say, pragmatic way and functional way. Uh, I would think, I, I think that this would be, this should be a possibility, so. Uh, and uh, what we have to try to find out is uh, which are these mechanisms, which which uh, which uh, standards we should be using for for such kind of activities. So, not sure if you, uh, I am. It's really difficult question. And, and it's, it's starting to become a second talk that you are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jordi, for that. And, that, and then, so no other questions are allowed because we need to provide further. Or you. Okay. In Leipzig, as in many other cities, we are in preparation to to um, write uh, our own data strategy. So. That's why it was interesting for me to see what are your main uh, components of the or the, yeah, contents of the of the data strategy. And in the same time, when you talk, we're talking about uh, uh, the data platform, uh, Green Deal data pl space data space. I, I saw in the consortium there were no cities as the ki kind of let's say pilot cities or whatever. Uh, but is there a is, is, is it planned to involve pilot cities maybe to just to to have this whole um, how to say data stream from the municipal level to the European level just to to test the interoperability uh, to see whether the standards are uh, fitting whatever uh, is, is there a plan or how to how have you planned to involve the cities? So uh, I, th 
I think that this, uh, this uh, the work of this coordination and support actions, probably Mark could uh, comment on better on that. But uh, they were formed with a, a specific collection of uh, actors which are working on that. And uh, probably there is mm, uh, little opportunity to become participant. I don't know if there is envisage any, any possibility on that, but uh, of course you can contact these, uh, these activities, these projects, and offer your experience. So uh, I mentioned about uh, uh, describing your use cases, which is really important. I, I think from, from contacts uh, from the grid project, for example, I know that they were searching for uh, a list of use cases which could be well documented. So uh, if you uh, contact these coordination and support actions and, and uh, uh, through, the, um, through the proper channels, let's say, uh, uh, you will get uh, some, some means of participation in, in the activity. All right. Thanks a lot for this uh, uh, intervention. That, that's a, that was a very in, important point. Good. Okay. Then we are moving forward, and I'm very happy that we have here Nesta Fernandez from also from Leipzig, from IDIP, um, and uh, giving to all this uh, the aspect of biodiversity now. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Nibos, especially to you for inviting me to give this talk. And I'm going to to speak. Uh, mostly from an European perspective, uh, European level perspective, about what I think are some needs and, and some of the work we are doing in relation to, to data um, collection, data integration, data interoperability, and data spaces for biodiversity. And I want to start with the uh, bad news. So uh, most of you are probably aware that we are in a, in a biodiversity crisis, which we often call, this is kind of the twin crisis of uh, climate. And we are not very successful in addressing this, this crisis. So, for example, the CBD, the Convention for Biological uh, Diversity, which is a body of the United, United Nations, um, set up a number of targets in 2010 to be met by 2020. This is only three years ago. And uh, after that decade, um, 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 the United Nations evaluated progress in meeting those targets, and the uh, headlines are here. The world failed to meet one single target to stop the destruction of biodiversity. So it is a really challenging thing that we are trying to address when we are speaking about halting the loss on biodiversity. And not only that, it's also a very complex uh, topic in terms of what we are addressing, because biodiversity um, is, is a very, it's a highly multidimensional uh, concept. So uh, when we are speaking about biodiversity loss, for many people it comes to the mind uh, the loss of species. But it's not only about losing species, it's also about losing functions that th those species provide in ecosystems. It's about uh, uh, losing services associated to those functions and so on. And also the, the biodiversity change itself is a highly multidimensional um, uh, um, topic. So, like for example, uh, when we are losing a species, uh, it's not that we are losing a species randomly in the world. We are species, species with certain characteristics. And if we look over history, we see that, for example, the mean size of the mammals of the world uh, have been decreasing. Um, if we look, uh, of course, to to um, to the long term, but also recently. Like, for example, right now, the mean size of endangered species is much smaller than the mean size of the average species uh, that we have in the world, meaning that we will continue uh, decreasing that mean size of a species. It's not only uh, about losing the big species, losing the mammals, and so on. Uh, there is quite a lot of evidence also that uh, up to 10% of the terrestrial arthropods are uh, declining uh, every decade. And as I said, this is a multidimensional problem which affects ecosystems, and uh, it's very associated to, to the activities uh, um, that we as humans are doing. Um, it is estimated that globally around 10% of the forests are deforested every 20 years, and uh, this didn't, uh, the speed of this uh, increase didn't stop. So, in Europe, we have uh, created a number of uh, mechanisms to try to halt the loss on biodiversity. 
and those are under the same umbrella of the Green Deal, but with uh, some specific goals and some specific targets. So, for example, there is a protection target, and the protection target says that uh, by 2030, we should have 30% of our land in Europe protected under uh, natural protected areas or landscape protection or any kind of protection. We are close to that, actually. We are not very far from there, but there is a, uh, even more uh, interesting but also challenging target, which is uh, we aim to protect 10% of the land under strict protection, whatever it means uh, that needs to be uh, further defined. There is a second uh, goal, which is the goal to restore ecosystems across land and sea, and this is something that uh, is very um, under, under um, discussion right now, because it, it's right now in the discussion in the European Parliament, and we hope that this law is approved. But if this law is approved, it's the first uh, law uh, addressing directly the protection of nature that is approved in the European Union in 30 years. And finally, uh, the Green Deal also uh, puts very uh, at the forefront the interactions between biodiversity and climate. So how protecting biodiversity can actually help us uh, protecting also uh, the climate or fighting uh, or um, working with policies of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Now, um, it is very obvious that uh, for doing assessments of biodiversity change and also for providing the information that is policy relevant for um, designing uh, protection policies, we need data. And we need data at multiple spatial scales, at multiple resolutions, and very often long term data. And there are some, some uh, major challenges regarding biodiversity data, the, the, the very intrinsic characteristics of the biodiversity data that we are collecting. Those are challenges that are similar to um, data in other fields, but there are some that are very specific for biodiversity, I would say. So first of all, is there, that there are persisting gaps and biases in in situ observation. So biodiversity monitoring depends uh, to a great extent, and I will uh, show some figures on this, depend on, on a great extent uh, on in situ data. So we cannot observe most of the biodiversity with satellites, for example. Uh, second, when we measure biodiversity change, it has complex uh, spatial scaling and temporal dynamics, uh, which means it's very difficult to bring to uh, bridge between different scales uh, of, uh, of the data. And uh, finally, uh, we are still not using enough biodiversity models and uh, scenarios in order to inform uh, policies and to design suitable for policies for biodiversity uh, protection. This is uh, two uh, figures. I, I could show many, many other pictures like this. Uh, those are two pictures of um, re representing gaps and biases in in situ data. To the left is the distribution of uh, the long-term um, ecological monitoring sites in Europe, and you can see there there is there is a high concentration of sites in some countries, but a very low concentration of, of sites in some of the countries that host uh, the, the most interesting biodiversity in Europe. And to the right, um, I pick it up uh, the distribution of data on one single species in Europe from GBIF, which is the biggest database of biodiversity data that we have. Those are locations of one species that many of you are familiar. This is a wild boar, Wild so, um, um, and if you can, if you look at the map, I mean, you, you could think, okay, wild boars are not present in, in a huge areas of Europe, particularly uh, in the southeast, in Central Europe, and so on, in, in Central East, and so on. No, it's not. It's not that. It's that even in the database with highest amount of biodiversity data, observations are not there. Now, how can the question comes? How can we make best use of the information that we are collecting? to detect, to report, and to respond to biodiversity change. And, uh, and uh, as I said before, I would like to stress that when we are speaking about biodiversity assessments and biodiversity monitoring, we are speaking about many different things in one word. Um, so biodiversity assessments are data hungry because uh, they require information on a species but it is information not only on the distribution of, of a species, it, it's also information on the abundance of different species or in the genetic uh, composition of the populations of different species or also on the traits of different species. So for example, I was putting the example before of the re reduction in the mean uh, size of mammals over time. 
Well, this is one trait, which is uh, the size of the, of the animal, but there are other very important traits, such as, for example, the movement, the reproductive capacity of the animals, and so on. And, and right now, I'm speaking about only about the species level information. Now, let's go to ecosystems. Um, in order to assess a biodiversity change, we also need to know to what extent the extent of different ecosystem types, types is changing, or what is the condition of those ecosystems in, in terms of what is the quality, or what is the primary productivity, and many, many other aspects. So um, this is, as I said, a, a, a very complex um, and uh, um, not non easily uh, scalable problem uh, that many people have uh, thought about. And one uh, way that the community, at least from a conceptual point of view, um, uh, has agreed to, to try to reduce that complexity is uh, the so-called essential biodiversity variables. Essential biodiversity variables are one subgroup of the essential variables, which is defined as a minimum set of measurements, which are complementary to one another, that can capture the major diverse, uh, dimensions of biodiversity change. And we could classify those essential biodiversity variables in two main blocks. One is uh, the block that look at the species, those distributions of species, changes in the abundance, etc. Uh, versus a second block that focus more uh, specifically on ecosystems. And those are two different levels that are very much related because, of course, ecosystems, uh, species make ecosystems, but they are usually observed from very different perspectives and also from different communities. Uh, so the essential biodiversity variables uh, aim, aim to uh, aggregate uh, the, a number of minimum uh, observations uh, that refer to, for example, genetic composition, species populations, species traits, and then the community composition, ecosystem and structure, and ecosystem functions, which are all of them also important, for example, for the ecosystem services, as I was mentioning. Uh, now, something that it's, the community uh, has uh, easily, can, can easily recognize is that for each of those essential biodiversity variables, it is really difficult uh, to find one single source of data that allows us to monitor over time uh, even one single variable at different spatial scales. Um, just imagine uh, that uh, you are familiar maybe with a bunch of species, a set of species, and you want to monitor over time how those species are changing. Well, immediately it comes the problem that different species are monitored, need to be monitored with different methods, different protocols, sometimes different techniques. For example, some species are observed di directly by bird watchers and you can uh, relatively easily count some species, but other species are almost indetectable to humans, and, and you need uh, genetic monitoring methods uh, to, to measure those species, right? So um, the essential biodiversity variables, the concept of the essential biodiversity variables, is then not only about prioritizing this minimum set of measurements that we need to monitor, but also specifying how we monitor them, integrating different sources of data. And, for many of the problems that we have in biodiversity conservation, uh, we have a big challenge is that we need spatially explicit data over time at the highest resolution uh, possible. This is like the holy grail, yeah? That, that's what we all need. If you want to select, for example, if you want to identify where in Europe we should uh, put new areas under protection, well, you can not, probably not do it with uh, country level data, yeah? You need high resolution data in order to be able to consistently identify those, those places. If you want to monitor over time which species and which ecosystems are changing and where, again, you need a high quality and high resolution data. So this is where this concept of the essential biodiversity variables uh, integration workflows come, which is about combining in situ data with uh, especially explicit sources of data, for example, from remote sensing or from other models in order to generate spatially explicit information over time for those variables that we cannot actually collect uh, in many, many places. Yeah? So this is, again, using models in order to fill gaps in biodiversity information. Um, so there are like uh, three main um, blocks in the, those uh, essential biodiversity variables monitoring workflows. One is the integration of multiple data streams. Second is uh, data model fusion to pr produce biodiversity change variables, and third, uh, to be able to find out how to develop indicators that are actually policy relevant. 
Uh, those workflows have been um, investigated by, by uh, different biodiversity communities, for example, uh, looking at the structure of ecosystems, uh, standardizing observations of morphological um, ecosystem traits, uh, also looking at the species populations, for example, checking how we can use many different sources of information on species uh, distributions and abundances to generate uh, a spatial explicit surfaces of information over time of how those species are changing, or also uh, species traits uh, such as, uh, as I said before, morphology and some life history traits uh, and so on. Now, in Europe, um, we have been uh, working the last uh, three years in the implementation of this concept under one project, and uh, which uh, also is becoming one network, which is called Europa One. Europa One is, uh, stands for the European Biodiversity Observation Network. And the idea of Europa One is to develop um, European level biodiversity monitoring center uh, that can actually facilitate the generation of those essential biodiversity variables. And this is uh, under the concept that, or under the idea that we really need to integrate the different actors collecting data in Europe, but also putting them together with the stakeholders that are actually uh, users of this, those data. And we are working in Europe on uh, focusing mostly on four main pillars. So the first pillar is to identify those essential biodiversity variables. Okay, of this huge range, uh, those dimensions that uh, actually define biodiversity, which are those variables where we should focus on? And um, we have been doing, we have been organizing um, different uh, participatory um, activities with many different stakeholders from the European Commission, from member states, from uh, natural park managers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to identify a minimum set of variables that could be monitored in Europe. And at the moment, we, we are stuck to 72, 72 uh, variables that cover uh, a range of terrestrial, freshwater, and marine biodiversity at those two levels, from species to, to ecosystems. And um, um, then the second pillar is, OK, um, those are the priorities for monitoring biodiversity from a policy perspective, also from the perspective of what is feasible. Now, what data is there, uh, what data is being collected already in Europe in order to be able uh, to monitor those essential biodiversity variables? How can we leverage the data that exists there? Uh, we have been doing a survey of um, monitoring in initiatives, looking not only at the initiatives that are actually integrating data in some ways. And, uh, and uh, we found uh, at the moment around 1,000 biodiversity data streams. This, is, this number is just to give you the, the magnitude of the complexity of the problem. And on using um, those biodiversity data streams and confronting them to the essential biodiversity variables, to the list of essential biodiversity variables that are uh, relevant for policy, we uh, started to identify what are the gaps and what are the bottlenecks in those data flows in order to monitor um, the essential biodiversity variables. And uh, we, this is still a work in progress, but quite advanced already. We found that, for example, uh, one of the main um, bottlenecks for monitoring uh, biodiversity in Europe is, okay, not, not uh, news, but it is lack of secured funding. And this affects more than 70% of the current uh, reporting streams, actually. And many of those streams are actually streams that are mandatory and go to uh, support European policies and national scale policies. But not only that, there, is so, there are also major gaps in terms of uh, uh, automatization of the collection and the transfer of data through infrastructures and so on. And only in 54% of the monitoring programs that we analyzed, there exists some kind of automatization. This is not complete automatization, it's only a part of, partial one. Even more, 88% of the programs are not using the generation of information on biodiversity to produce models or to produce the scenarios. So what it shows is there is a huge room for improvement there. And finally, of course, data access limitations still pre prevail, many of those data uh, the vast majority, of course, is not made uh, open and publicly available, and even and uh, many, many of them are not uh, following the fair principles. The third pillar is the design of workflows that allow us to integrate the data 
doing a, this combination of in-situ data with other sources of spatial explicit information. And when we analyze it, the, the essential biodiversity variables that are critical to monitor biodiversity in Europe, we found that uh, at least 57 of those variables depend to a great extent on in-situ data. And those uh, can be, for example, is data that can be collected from structures monitoring uh, programs, but also from citizen science observations. And some of them, a few of them, uh, could be uh, monitored partly using new technologies, such as, for example, eDNA or high resolution uh, hyperspectral remote sensing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we also found that uh, some of those variables, 26 of them, depend mostly on remote sensing data. Those are, as you can figure out, uh, mostly the ecosystem level variables but still they need high quality data uh, in situ data in order to train and to uh, assess the models. The fourth uh, pillar of, this, uh, of the implementation of this concept at the, at the European level is showcasing how the development of the essential biodiversity variables can actually inform particular policies at the European level. And this is something that we are working with some colleagues of, of the, um, uh, well, of different kinds of stakeholders, but including uh, colleagues from the European Commission. Um, uh, checking how different essential biodiversity variables, a, a reduced number of them, some pilot biodiversity, uh, essential biodiversity variables can actually inform the birds directive, the habitat directive, the water framework directive, and some cross-cutting policies, including, for example, soil restoration policies. And what we are doing here is working together with uh, stakeholders to address their needs in terms of identifying information that can support policies. Uh, showcase how the workflows for producing those essential biodiversity variables can be produced, and finally uh, demonstrating the use for uh, policy. Now, um, I'm going to show very quickly uh, only one example of what is our concept behind this. So usually, um, most of the times, we have um, um, data, in situ data, that is being collected by different initiatives. So the first difficulty is, of course, mobilizing data, uh, well, finding data and, and mobilizing that data uh, through uh, public repositories and using uh, standard metadata, etc. cetera. Uh, second is to identify, okay, we know that our data is uh, uh, sparse in space. How can we complete, how, how can we fill the gaps, the spatial gaps? And, and then it is uh, about identifying what information, what spatial explicit information can provide us ideas of what are the drivers of biodiversity change over time and what are the pressures. So if we are able to select or to identify um, significant drivers and pressures on that particular aspect of biodiversity, then we would be able to model over time changes in biodiversity. And finally, um, uh, with that data combination, uh, create what we call the essential biodiversity variables data cubes. Those are cubes of data that contain um, um, spatial and temporal information for multiple um, biodiversity entities. Biodiversity entities are, for example, multiple species or multiple ecosystem types and so on. So that's why they are multidimensional uh, data sets. We are, one of the examples is uh, monitoring changes in the habitat extent in, in a couple of European countries for habitats that are listed under the Habitats Directive, which is the, the European directive that uh, protects uh, or has the mandate uh, or gives the mandate to, to countries to protect certain habitats. And, uh, and what we are doing is um, leveraging information that is actually uh, collected at the regional level, combining this information with uh, state-of-the-art remote sensing techniques, and, uh, and then developing um, uh, models that uh, allow us to predict uh, changes in the habitat extent. Now, um, it's not only about uh, monitoring. So monitoring is, of course, central to biodiversity policies. You can, you, you can only know if you are successful with, uh, with your protection policies uh, if you monitor biodiversity at the appropriate uh, spatial scale and over sufficient time. Uh, it's also about using essential biodiversity variables to support planning, protection planning. And I said at the beginning that one of the targets of the European Biodiversity Study is to protect 30% uh, of uh, the terrestrial areas and the marine areas in Europe, and also the 10% strict protection. But there is one more thing that this study says, is that this protection should also 
increase the connectivity between the protected areas so that the, our ecosystems are more resilient to change in the future, such as, for example, climate change. So um, one of the ways that we are starting to use now the essential biodiversity variables is in, in an European funded project called Natura Connect uh, is using those variables uh, which are modeled information on biodiversity in order to identify where to distribute those protection areas and those corridors. Now, um, we are speaking about essential biodiversity variables. Those become into uh, those complex data cubes. Uh, but we are speaking about highly different data sets from the structure of ecosystems to the distribution of species. How we should uh, distribute those uh, data sets in a way uh, that is, uh, they are comparable, right? And, and we can mobilize them in a systematic way similarly and we can actually analyze them uh, together. Um, we have been working also in recent years in developing what we call the essential biodiversity variables data cube. This is um, a specification, a standard that provides consistent metadata. Not, not, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of variable you are, but uh, the metadata is consistent across them. It is also the data sets, the cubes are also interoperable and uh, we are trying to facilitate access to them. And uh, for this is why we have been developing also the Geobond uh, portal for the essential biodiversity variables, which serves the Geobond community. This is the geo community on, on, Earth, on biodiversity observations in uh, the mobilization of data sets at any spatial scale and any resolution. So this can be, for example, from, uh, from subnational data sets on ecosystems or, or species to global data sets that can, for example, support uh, global assessments such as those uh, needed by the Convention for Biological Diversity. Uh, I invite you to, to go to this uh, portal. It's uh, portal.geobond.org. But basically, for example, there uh, we are mobilizing those data sets uh, of uh, predicted distributions of habitats that aim to support the habitats directive of the European Union. Um, I, I think I don't have a lot of time to, to go into, into the details, so um, uh, I'll, I'll skip this one. Now, what we are aiming for in Europa Bon and associated projects such as Natura Connect is to deliver open data um, structuring a ecosystem way uh, in a way that member states, regions, and also the European Commission and the European Environmental Agency can use systematically different uh, types of data uh, for their assessments. And what is happening now is that there is some standardization in how the different countries report to the European Commission and the European Environmental Agency on how biodiversity is changing, but below the national level, there is no standard at all. So there is no way of knowing where the information that the countries are reporting comes from. Um, just my three, my last slide with uh, three take-home uh, messages, or perhaps kind of very, uh, yeah, uh, outlines of a data roadmap for the decade in biodiversity information. So there is a lot of. Uh, data being collected. It's not that we are not collecting data. We are collecting a lot of data, but we need to leverage uh, the existing data that is being reported in a way that it can be used by scientists and, uh, um, and others in a way that we can produce actually essential biodiversity variables and, and make better of that data. Um, second, we need to increase the ways of fostering integration with continuous spatial temporal data in order to produce biodiversity products that are fit for several purposes, from regional planning to European level and global level assessments. And finally, there is a clear need to continue developing a standardized data access to infrastructures, which most of them are currently in their infancy. So thank you, and uh, I don't know if there is time for questions. Excellent talk. Thanks a lot, Nestor. And then we are setting up the next presentation. While we're doing that, there is one question allowed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very, very interesting, uh, specifically because of these essential biodiversity variables. And I was figuring out whether you also, in the, in the center of biodiversity, think about variables 
that you should probably know if it comes to behavioral change in the society. So which are the important variables which you should know for the society so that society change behavior? Mm -hmm. So that might be also essential variables. That's a very good point. And actually, there is uh, some initiative on, on the essential social variables. But something that uh, uh, links um, biodiversity monitoring with society directly is uh, ecosystem services. And uh, there has been also some, some work um, on identifying those ecosystem service variables and monitoring those variables. And uh, under the Europa One project, one of the projects that I have presented, uh, we are also trying to map how certain uh, ecosystem, certain biodiversity variables are actually informed on the demand, uh, uh, on the provision side of the essential ecosystem uh, service variables. So yes, there, there are good connections. Still, there is a lot of work to, to do. And, and your question is almost more for a psychologist. But, uh, <laughs> but I take it, it's, it's really important, yeah. Great. Thanks. For that. So let's move forward to the uh, like, a, again a, a round of applause for for Nestor. And I'm inviting Ingo Simonis, <laughs> Chief um, Technology uh, Director of OGC. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Niels. Good afternoon, everyone. So if you um, if you type in a headline in a in a PowerPoint slide, right? You're probably all aware of this designer tool that pops up and shows how to advance and how to uh, enhance your slide to make it prettier. Well, that's what I did, right? I uh, put in the Green Deal, and, and it seems all soft, right? The AI in the tool shows us four different seasons. It's a green summer, it's a white winter, it snows, it rains, so wonderful. Uh, that's the level of the AI that we have these days. And the question is, well, what do we need to do uh, to get the better overview, to find the data that Hector is looking for, to, to bridge these gaps that we currently have? If we look at the Green Deal and, um, and a little bit the, the development, right, in 2019 when uh, Ursula von der Leyen um, announced the plan, she talked about the European man on the moon moment and what she meant, well, this will be the first continent that will become climate neutral by 2050. So that's uh, the big challenge. Um, so far, we have seen a, a lot of policy elements from Jordi that needs implementation. Um, the question is exactly how, right? We see uh, lots of projects ongoing. Um, one of the challenges, certainly coordination. But if you look at what happened, right, within these uh, years, 19, 20, 21, we moved into the, uh, the European climate law. Um, the parliament voted to support uh, the Green Deal. They even requested more ambitious targets, so the 55% net reduction in uh, greenhouse gases compared to the 1990 timeline that w was coming out of these discussions. And then we had the climate law that carved it in stone. So how to implement the Green Deal, right? One option is certainly the European Climate Pact. Who knows about the European Climate Pact? Okay, the European Climate Pact is the option for each one of us to contribute, right? Because the climate deal is nothing we will solve in this room. The climate deal is just something each one of us can help solving by changing behavior, by changing behavior. And the European Climate Pact allows you to say, hey, I, I stop driving to the bakery, right? Every Saturday and Sunday, I walk to the bakery to buy some bread rolls. Uh, classical German habit, right? Sundays and Saturdays, it's no muesli mornings, it is, uh, it's bread rolls. And uh, I'm living in a tiny little village, 11,000 inhabitants, uh, just at the outskirts of Frankfurt, so there's not much space. It's a very compact city. Within this very compact city, I think we have seven bakeries. So there's not a single place in the city that requires you to walk more than 300 meters to the bakery. I'm still the only one showing up every Saturday and Sunday on foot. Everyone else on cars. The European Climate Pact allows you to say, I change this. The European Climate Pact even allows you to say, my entire business will change and we will become more climate friendly by X, right? You can sign up to change. 
The overarching game, well, that's for sure, right? The first climate neutral content by 2050, that's super ambitious. We do have these interim goals, like the 50% uh, net reduction by 2030. That's just seven years from now. It's in the law, right, that we want to get there, but I mean, what do we need to do with the law if we don't? Okay, well, we have these ambitions. We have mechanisms in place, right? We do have forcing mechanisms like the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So if you don't get towards or you don't develop according to the uh, set goals, there are specific mechanisms to force the individual countries. We have those action plans like the circular economy that are within the, uh, the European uh, Commission realm for quite some time now. We review all the existing systems because some have some questionable climate merits like the emission trading system, right? It's, is it really supporting the Green Deal or not so much right now? Uh, elements like the energy taxation directive, right? So why do we pay more taxes for some energy compared to others, right? Why is flying cheaper than uh, taking the car or taking the train? Good questions. And then we have all these strategies, right? Um, we have just the, the biodiversity strategy. We do have mobility, forestry, farm to fork, which is all about the agriculture. Um, building and renovation, so there are many, many, many elements to reach these overarching aims. And as we have seen, right, we can all contribute by just walking instead of taking the car. Um, we, can, we can do other things like 90% um, or roughly 90% of all buildings in Europe are built prior to 1970, which means from the energy consumption they are with room for enhancements. And the current uh, renovation rate for these buildings in Europe is how many percent? Right, one percent, right? Um, so <laughs> most of our buildings are crap and we renovate one percent of them per year. Maybe we can accelerate a little bit. The question now is what can IT do, right? We are um, in the Open Geospatial Consortium, we are a hub of um, computer nerds, um, to a large extent, and people dealing with location data in the sense of, well, information technology data. Um, the question is, what can we, do, uh, can we do with it? And it's pretty simple, right? It's damn simple. If you want to solve the Green Deal from the IT perspective, you just have the right information at the right time in the right format, and then you can act. That's all you need. It's that simple. The only challenge is, to get the right information or the right data, right? Um, either it doesn't exist at all. Um, I'm an ecologist by training and uh, we spent uh, one year in, uh, in Finland and we did lots of ecological studies and whenever we got close to a result, we figured mm, the time series is not long enough, the temporal resolution is not good enough or the spatial resolution is too coarse. So how do we get to the right information at the right time, right? And how do we get it presented? It doesn't really matter if you are on the left or on the right camp. Who is uh, the data is the new oil camp and who is, this is not right, this is not the new oil? Well, it doesn't really matter, right? Because actually they both mean the same thing. Um, this is a quote, data is the new oil, 2006-ish, um, I think. Um, Clive Humley, a UK mathematician. And what he meant is, is actually, well, the, the oil isn't useful in the raw state, right? You need to do something with it, refine it, process it, turn it into something useful. The value actually lies in the potential. And that's the same thing we need to do with data, right? The raw data that we have, well, not that useful. We need to do something with it. And that even doesn't matter if it's not so much about data, it's super data. Super data is the new oil of the century. But actually, as placative as it is, right, super data is the new oil, this is about the role AI can play. And the role AI can play is very, very fuzzy right now. But we have a couple of challenges that are absolutely unsolved by now, where we have at least the hope that AI can help us to enhance the current situation. Questions? How much data is really out there? Always 
In all our presentations, you see these graphs, right? Exponential growth in data, exponential growth in sensors, exponential in everything. And whenever you go out and do some analysis, we are involved in, uh, in I think, about 10 projects funded by the European Commission as OGC and another 10 projects funded by private industry and governments. And uh, in all these 20 projects, it's the same situation, right? Lack of data. And it's frustrating. So where is all this exponential growing data? And how to discover it? That brings us to the F like in findable. And then the question is, well, how to access it? I think access to data is not so much the problem anymore. We have fantastic APIs, we have good standards for it, we know how to access data. That's not so difficult. But how do I serve it most efficiently and useful to others? Well, that's a challenge, right? Because we have tried quite a number of things, uh, Inspire being one of them, um, partly very successful, partly with room for improvement, so how can we improve? And then the last element, the R, like in reusable, right? How can I reuse the data that is provided by others? And here are a couple of ideas. These ideas uh, stem from lots of discussions we have at the OGC. The OGC has 550 something members right now. And uh, this really helps us to be a kind of a knowledge exchange hub, right? And we hear so much. Uh, requirements, ideas, and solutions from our members, and it provides us a great uh, discussion space. And what I will present now is a result of uh, quite a number of these, these discussions. And by the way, right, this is the biggest uh, number I found, uh, the recent number, 15.14 billion IoT devices, and they all do this fantastic and magic things. Well, first of all, if you, if you uh, decipher this number a little bit, right, and if you think, hmm, we have 8 billion people on the planet, probably at least half of them have a cell phone, or two, or three, who has only one cell phone at home? Not what it is in use, right, but at home. Okay, well, it's at least three out of 100. So, it's not that much, we have, right? We need to have more sensors. We need to uh, observe the environment better. But here's an idea. First of all, make the data available, right? I, uh, I mean, we have this discussion, in particular in Europe, with all the, uh, the, let's say, the more emphasis on privacy, on security. Uh, but nevertheless, things have changed towards open data, which is a great development. But even then, right, there's lots and lots of data still hidden. Uh, lots of data is available in reports, in printed reports, and it's n by far not all available. But we have great standards that we can use. So actually, it shouldn't be that difficult to make all the data available to everyone. But the thing is, if we just use standards, we will not achieve our goal. We tried this. Several times, every country in Europe has a national space data infrastructure. Every country. Which country would say our space data infrastructure is a great success? So the idea is, do not focus only on the standards. We need to have more. We need to have what we call building blocks, formalized building blocks. First, these are elements that have been used by others, so it has been proven that works. And they allow machine discovery, which is the first step towards enhanced use of the data. So let's decipher a little bit what these building blocks are, because uh, in OGC we talk, every meeting we talk about building blocks and everyone means something different. So um, here's one idea what these building blocks are. Let's first talk about the discovery building blocks. Sticking to catalogs is, well, problematic. We all remember these, uh, these mail order um, organizations, right? Quelle and Neckermann and uh, what was Otto, the, th the three big ones in this country. Certainly every country has those big catalogs that were printed 20 years back or 30 years back, right? And they provided all you could order. Um, that works. I mean, that the super catalogs always work, right? What is the biggest super catalog? Well, the, the Googles and Bings and what's not on the internet. They work. You find usually what you are looking for. Maybe not the exact best hit, but you find what you're looking for. 
catalogs for data do not work. We have done catalogs for data for now 25, 30 years, and they do not work. First, where is the damn thing? Where are these data catalogs? That is a big question. Or service catalogs? And then how do you actually explore them, right? We do have standards for these things. Uh, we OTC did standards about these things. We still do, but they do not work that way. And the key is, well, the vanilla data catalog cannot be discovered, right? Because it's not machine readable. You never hear about that. So what is the discovery building block? And as you can see here, it's not a Lego stone, right? It's not a tiny little thing where you have a full box of it and then you just connect them. The building block is really a complex element like this, these apartment cubes here, right? They have lots of lots of function, lots of detail in them. The first thing is we need to describe the data in a machine readable form. If it's not available in machine readable form, we never find it. The only way we find data in some engines or some platforms like Google Earth Engine is, well, because they made it machine readable. They talked about it, the web page got indexed, you read about it, oh, there's this data available, great. Second, link your descriptions to other resources, right? As long as there are no links available between these resources, well, it's always difficult to find you things. And then advertise what you have. Advertisement is key. Advertisement works. But if you go to a spatial data provider and ask, how many users do you have per month? How many hits? Oh, you really hear about these things, right? You every week can hear how many hits uh, whatever Twitter gets. But you rarely read how many hits a specific data service gets in the more, let's say, geospatial data infrastructure or spatial data infrastructure world. So advertisement is key. The next thing is the metadata building block. The issue is we stick to these homogeneous models, right? We try to define a single metadata model that should work for all of us. Well, the big problem is, at the one side, this underspecifies, right? It does not provide sufficient detail on the things that are important to you. At the same time, it overspecifies. It requires lots of things to put in that you don't care about. And the question is, can we enforce the use of these homogeneous models? And the lessons learned over the last 30 years with spatial infrastructures is we cannot, right? People will spend the minimum motivation and, in, and yeah, minimal motivation to serve according to these homogeneous models because they don't meet their reality, right? Their everyday life is different. And if I don't get in the standardized model what I need, why should I use it? Okay, I'm forced by law. Okay, I deliver, but just the minimum. And I don't connect it to my backend systems. That's a problem. What can we do? Well, we need well-defined machine-readable terminology first. This terminology must be available online 24-7, and it must be available in multiple formats so the machines could understand it, humans can understand it, that's key. And then provide mappings to other metadata models. Stick to a couple of good ideas or principles, but do not require and force everyone to use the same model. It will not work data model building block. That's another situation, right? You're sitting in your office and you think about your data model. How do humans do data models? Who starts from scratch? Probably nobody. We copy, paste and edit, right? We find something that we use as a template and then we edit the things. So because the other model is always crappy and our own model is always better, Right? We always enhance a little bit, but we copy everything. What we copied, we don't let anyone know. We just edit and then we sell it as the new great thing. And then we have our consumers, right? Here is my data. Feel free to use, my, uh, to use it and make sense of HTMAX equals 12.48, right? This doesn't mean anything to anyone. So, but this is the same situation. I mean, we are involved in many projects where they share data and we still get this crap. It is 2023 and we still get HTMAX equals 12.48 and there's no link to what it actually means. It means I need to find the specification for this data model and read on page 112 
what this element actually means. So what is the building block? Well, reuse, that's great, right? Reuse is, is perfect, don't, don't reinvent. But instead of copy, paste, edit, try reference and edit. Say, I use this, but I edit this part. Because if you do not copy it, but you just reference the master copy, everyone else can understand what you actually reused. And your data model suddenly will become much easier to consume by others. And then, um, yeah, edit the parts you need. This is important. Edit the parts you need. This is all about these conceptual models and the logical models, right? We, we can all agree what a building is at a very high level, right? Not in the details. If you build the building, you have a complete different view on it as if you are sitting here and, and watch this presentation, for sure. But we can say, yeah, this was uh, a specific building. So um, the thing called identity, right? This is something we need to work on. If we say, I have data about a city or a park or an ecosystem or whatever you are actually um, investigating, we need to understand if there's other data available for the thing you are dealing with. So instead of creating multiple identities for the same thing and having no links between them, right? we need to get one level further. We need to understand if we are talking about the same thing because only then we can discover additional data for these things. And ideally, not as humans, but as machines which forces us to think more about these conceptual and logical models, right? The conceptual model is really the very abstract idea of the uh, object of the real world. And then the logical model, that contains all the attributes, all the details about it that are important to you. But because we may share the conceptual model and we share the identifier for a specific real world object, we know, oh, we are talking about the same part actually and the same um, function it has in terms of heat islands, for example. Um, little advertisement, right? Advertisement helps. On Wednesday, we do have a full day workshop uh, on, it's unfortunately called semantics, and semantics scares everyone off, right? Semantics, mm, I heard about this, Semantic Web 2002, and it failed. Um, there is a new view on that, right? It's more called, let's say, the pragmatic view on semantics. So join the class given by Alejandro and, and Rob uh, the whole day. It's, um, it's amazing because the ideas I just pitched today, because we don't have more time, will be discussed in far more detail. And you see that there are actually technologies and ideas behind it, right? It's not only um, ideas, it is already something substantial. There is this information context. We all, about, we all hear about these analysis-ready data and decision-ready indicators and interpretation-ready information, right? This, these are additional building blocks, building blocks that we need to create in order to make sure others find our data, can access it, and reuse it. We are now doing this in more and more three- and four-dimensional immersion elements, right? It's not that you only um, access the data. You can see how it develops over time, ideally even visualized in a, you know, almost like reality-looking um, virtual environment. When we have an actual observation, like the one here in the center, um, if we interpret, standardize, and normalize it, we get to interpretation-ready data. If we go one step further, we do some analysis with it, processing or prediction, we get to analysis-ready data. If we go the other way um, from the observable observation via transformation or translations, then we can get to the decision-ready indicators. And that's so important because at the end we have all these different stakeholders involved, right? From the product provider on the upper left corner via the analysis, the, in this case emergency manager, responder, affected public, there are so many elements in here and they all need to have, well, they all need help in how to create the system that makes everything reusable because there is, in fact, lots of data, even not enough. But there are opportunities out there which we certainly miss because we don't find the data or we can't reuse it. So, in summary, please make your data available. Please make your data available. 
use standards. The standards are good, the standards are proven, they work. If you go to these web APIs, it follows the same principle that made the internet so super successful, right? It's, you go there and you find a product that you can actually use. We are now working on these formalized building blocks. And um, if you like, join the discussion at OGC. It's an open discussion uh, what these building blocks actually need to entail. It's lots about, well, I have data. How do I publish it in the ideal way so that others can use it? Or I need data. How can I find it and make use of it? So these are the building blocks that we are talking about. And then build required products and indicators. 20 years ago, or uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s, the general idea was, here's my server, and it includes all the data, and here's a complex query language, and whatever you need, you find it in my data. You just need to provide this super complex query. Well, for sure, few people actually use these servers, right? Because first, you need to understand that the server is there, well, hard, because it wasn't indexed by the search engines. Second, you need to understand the query language, Hard again, another 200 pages of specification. And then you actually need to find out what you can ask for. Yet another challenge to master. But now we have a much better understanding how to do these products. We can do them the web way, which means there's a URL you can hit. Maybe you have a little filter, but in general, you just hit the URL and you get the product. The question is, what products do we need to produce? What are the indicators that we need to produce? Get away from, here's my data, do this extra step, even if it's extra work, but do this extra step to say, okay, here's my data that is actually useful to others, and serve this in a way that is compliant with these formalized building blocks, because then it will be discovered and it will be used. And yes, there might be a little um, gain for you as a data provider, but from the overall picture, from fighting climate change, from reaching our 2050 um, goal, this is certainly a valid contribution. And with these words, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to receive questions. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. Your uh, presentations are always a pleasure. <laughs> Uh, we are running out of time a little bit, but I think one or two questions are allowed if there are any in the room. <laughs> yes. um, do you have examples of projects that you feel do a good job of uh, using the building blocks, or are they still aspirational at this point? They are in development right now as we speak, so to a good extent they are aspirational. Um, we have good understandings on now on how they should look like or how they will look like, and they are now implemented. We have the first, the um, access building blocks built. So there are endless uh, examples now of these access mechanisms, which use a specific set of um, standards to model the data and then to access it by the web. These have been um, tested very intensively. The next step now is um, to work on the more complex building blocks, like I have data, how do I provide it in general, right? So it's more a kind of um, the steeper learning curve that you usually need to go through in order to model it the the right way. But um, OGC is, uh, and that's why I'm so happy to see this other um, academy or learning platform out there, right? We are in the process of launching a uh, academy that will explain all these things. Because what we learned is um, we have a big program in OGC which is called Collaborative Solutions and Innovation. And it's a nerd, by nerds for nerds program. And we learned that we need to communicate differently. And the academy will then explain um, these uh, building blocks and show examples. But that's, um, we just started with it. This takes a little while. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your talk. It's, it's stuck a lot of uh, good elements with uh, what we're doing. Um, one thing I did feel you miss out, missed out was the, the community of open software providers and things like Wikidata, Wikipedia, things that people like the EU are not funding at all, and yet are, are, are way ahead 
in terms of sharing data, interoperating between data, um, and, and that many users just giving up on all of these different silos and migrating to uh, and <coughs> to Wikidata to do work on biographies of people. Um, how can we fund those things, um, but still leave them to be independent and, uh, and innovative? So you ask how we can fund them? Yeah, well, I, I've asked the commission, can we fund, can we fund uh, R and yeah. uh, CRAN? No. They're not funded by anybody in our community, but we use them all the time for modeling. Hmm. It's probably a question I need to forward to Jordi, right? It's <laughs> less, less my field. Um, we, we do fund research in OGC as well. Um, but this is always driven by the members, right? And as long as we don't receive sponsoring from our member organization, we can't do much. We are ourselves dependent on funding that we, for example, receive um, from the Commission or other international providers. Um, I think one of the issues with um, these, let's say, all-encompassing platforms is um, As, as soon as we see a value in using them, we have the potential to accelerate a business out of them. Um, if we take, for example, an infrastructure provider like Google, like Amazon or AWS, right? Why do they provide all this data for free? Right? Because they want you to use the computing cycles on their platform. So how can we enable these platforms to find this element that actually leads to the motivation to really publish things here? At the moment, uh, what I hear often is that they are considered a big sink. And um, people provide uh, the necessary metadata to put things in there, and then they don't necessarily see enhanced usage of it. And that leads to frustration. And when you ask them, OK, what additional advertisements did you do to make the world know it's there? Um, and then it's usually not much, right? So maybe we need to look at the whole data provisioning system in a much more economic way. And we need to use mechanisms that have been successful elsewhere in the data economy, because we are not there yet, definitely not. And I see a big value in these initiatives. Um, others I see more critically. If I look at very successful endeavors like schema.org, right? It's, uh, it's used in many places, but at the end of the day, it's a single vendor. And it's a black hole. You want to change anything in there? No chance, right? You want to reorganize it? You want to modularize it? No chance. So. Going the open way is definitely the path we need to take in terms of these schema.orgs, open schema.org, for example, right, would be something. Um, with data, can these super platform idea work? I don't think so. But we need to team up with the organizations that can help making it reality. If I look at the investments of uh, the European Commission into the Green Deal IT sector, and then you compare it with the investments in AWS, Google, and Microsoft put into their IT platforms for data, it's out of balance. It's out of balance, and it's not like this, right? It's that. This is the out of balance thing. And I think we need to work more intensively, even if it's open, we need to work very intensively with the powerful providers and infrastructure providers in this case uh, in particular to make these things more reality. Because I have the impression if I look at, at um, these open platforms, there are a couple of examples which work fantastic, right? Um, I mean, Wikipedia is a good example, right? They are always w looking for money. <laughs> every every third month this banner comes up, hey, would you please uh, donor or provide a donor to this uh, foundation? Why is that the case and how do we fund these things in future? Is it always a mechanism that we use taxpayers' money? I don't think so. They will not survive. But I don't have the answer how to fund it, right? so I would love to have one. 
I think we need we need to to overcome that everything must be a hundred percent open. Make it open, but allow people to make money with it. Climate change is a very, very, very big business as well. It is not only a challenge, it is a super big business. And we Europeans are super good at missing out of these opportunities, right? We are very slow, and then we say, hey, you're North American, this is unfair, you make all the money with it. And we need to get beyond that thinking. This is, I think, one of the key um, well, elements in this discussion. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Ingo. <clears throat> and sorry for stealing a bit of your coffee time, a coffee break time, but I think that was definitely worth it to listen to all these high-level speakers. So thanks, Jordi, Nestor, and Ingo. And uh, um, again, another applause for all of them. We have a coffee, coffee break outside, and then afterwards uh, there are four sessions in parallel, so there is the difficult ch uh, choice to make where to go, and then we're seeing afterwards in, the, in a couple of minutes. Thanks a lot.
the, the core uh, topic of, the, of these days, of these innovation days here. And it is uh, set up, so you see already the different uh, uh, the setting here. We have a tables. It is starting with a presentation from Anti, and then we have a, a demonstration also from Lassi. And then afterwards, we are going to, uh, to discuss about all these difficult topics that already kind of uh, started to be, become a discussion in the, in the morning and in the previous session. All right, I'm giving the floor to Antti, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Niels. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to, to present the Location Innovation Hub and the GOE3 project. Um, we have very ambitious title, as Niels said. We are going to be trying to talk about the, uh, how we enable uh, a geospatial ecosystem for, for Europe. I will start, I will not explain, but Jordi saw, uh, saw this picture about the European uh, data spaces. And what I want to say about this is that location is a component in many of, of the sectoral data spaces. And I think it would be nice if we would have a solution um, how to deal with the location data um, and obviously most, or, well not most, but a quite big number of this geospatial data is coming through these high value data sets from the, from the public sector. And, and also there is the other um, geospatial data, for example, meteorological data in this high value data set um, and statistical data. So we would like to see that uh, location would be easily merged or used within those European data spaces. Um, in general, what is happening with the, in Europe, uh, on, especially on digital twins, and, and especially nationally um, the, within the mapping agencies, is that nearly, um, well, not nearly, but um, let's say leading countries have announced that they will create these national digital twins based on laser scanning. And I have two examples here. This one example is one from Germany, which is building the uh, digital twin 40 points per square meter ready next year and uh, uh, update uh, to, to a three year interval. I put also Estonia there. Uh, they, they already have three buildings and they have included the vegetation uh, on that. We have also know that France is building at least uh, 10 points per square meter, etc. So there, there are quite many countries that are now building this basis for managing smart cities and, and managing the, uh, managing the uh, spatial data. Um, so there is uh, a, a basis for this. And I put some e example which we are also dealing with GOE3 is this building example. And building scores 40% of the EU energy consumption and 36% of the CO2 emissions. Um, so it's, it's important to have right information, good information, uh, especially on, on buildings, for example. We have another example that the Commission uh, is building this destination urge. They are building this digital twin of the urge uh, from, the, from the meteorological point of view at the moment, but also the land component is coming there. I don't show the, the video here, but, but we have to think about that there are different initiatives, this, this uh, European data spaces and then this destination urge that has an impact on what, what, what we should be thinking, uh, how, how, how this geospatial is utilized. So why we need location data uh, in European data spaces is that location connects different data and makes it understandable. And, and, and if you think about digital twins, it's not only 3D, but it also combines a lot of, lot of other data uh, so, uh, for example, you uh, do through this kind of dashboard. So there are huge data volumes that are involved, and everything happens somewhere. Where uh, so location-based user interfaces are natural. I put one example that is coming from the GOE3 project, which is the solar energy potential. This is coming from Finland. There's, there's this um, 
a church in the in in Helsinki, very complicated uh, structure, and and you can see our example that uh, you can um, you can see that what is the energy efficiency, uh, let's say what is the solar potential of, for example, that that building based on 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 geospatial uh, data and also meteorological data. So if we go to the GOE3, we have been running this project uh, now nearly three years. Um, it's supposed to end end of September, but we are seeking now an extension uh, until uh, end of February. If we get uh, the extension, we will be able to uh, demonstrate a little bit more about the results. But what are what have been the object objectives of the GOE3 is the better access and, and interoperability of geospatial data and other data. So, so we want to be in the situation that when we can easily combine other data with geospatial data. And there are certain examples what we are doing there. Uh, then we are doing this dynamic harmonization of geospatial data based on the use cases and new APIs, uh, the OGC new APIs, for example. Um, and uh, the idea is that we build on the, let's say, these kind of national services. So uh, I, at least I'm a strong believer that we should be basing on the national solutions so that we can guarantee that this data that we utilized when we integrate things is actually most accurate and most uh, recent data so we shouldn't copy the data, for example, from, from those national, uh, national services, but use it directly from those services. And then we are trying to build this ecosystem based on the national platforms. And, and basically, we, we uh, are providing these e-learning uh, videos, which is we, we name this location Innovation Academy. One of the ways that we are doing this is our organizing innovation events, and this is one of our innovation events that we are organizing uh, together with OGC and, and to provide the, the benefits. We, uh, we said that we are concentrating on the, on the use cases, so these three use, main use cases have been our focus. Uh, so um, the, the optimized use of the solar energy and the energy efficiency of the buildings. Uh, I showed one example on the on the solar energy already. We are currently doing this um, this uh, experiment with the energy efficiency of buildings, with data uh, from Finland, Estonia, and Spain, and uh, we believe that this da data that we have from the buildings can be used to estimate how energy efficient the buildings are. We would should have the results available end of September, and then we will report that. We are also doing a little bit on the intelligent transport systems and how uh, these elect electric vehicles uh, can be estimation of how, how far they can go. Um, and that is especially concentrating on Norway and, and Finland. And then we are doing the smart city play, uh, use case. And tomorrow uh, we will uh, demonstrate the smart cities with our hackathon winners. So if you are interested to see the Three hackathon winners, uh, uh, please come to our session that starts at one o'clock. There's also Leipzig hackathon winners there to, to demonstrate how, how uh, our data can be used for smart cities. I saw, uh, as, uh, Lassi will be demonstrating the platform. I saw one picture from Lassi. So this is the, ex, uh, the uh, example of the, of the German uh, Netherlands border how we can take these 3D building data and, and, and use it uh, combined and, and uh, lastly probably can demonstrate some of these, this data in, in, in live. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to show you is this interoperability map. It's a kind of maturity model and um, um, reflecting what Ingo actually said in the previous session we, we have tried to kind of uh, put uh, into a place, uh, let's say, not using the metadata directly, but actually analyzing what is, the, what is the interoperability level of certain data from certain countries. And we always know that this interoperability level will not be the most ideal, probably, in, in each of the cases. 
but we want to be giving this information to the users that uh, that uh, level three would be the, the let's say our most at, uh, optimized thing in, in in all of these three aspects that we, we consider legal and organizational aspects, technical aspects, and semantic aspects. But we give this kind of let's say an overview of how how interoperable certain data set uh, from a certain country is that when you are using the data you actually have some kind of understanding how interoperable that is. Um, I already mentioned the Location Innovation Academy. That's a kind of, if I reflect to what um, Inga was saying in the last session, that this kind of building blocks. So we basically have now these three building blocks data management, service management, and data service integration. So basically, let's say we give, a, let, not maybe the ideal, most ideal, but let's say the best practice today on those building blocks. And I would recommend you to have a look uh, how you would need to do interoperability and uh, what kind of guidance we can give for people when you take the national data and try to merge this data to your services. Finally, I, I uh, say something about the future, uh, which is the Location Innovation Hub. It's a, a part of the, uh, of the Europe and Digital Innovation Hubs that have now been started. It's supported by the Digital Europe program. Um, uh, we, there's 152 hubs that have started uh, in Europe. I saw that there's uh, at least one other hub here, a Saxony hub. Uh, we are presented also uh, also here. Um, it's coordinated by the Finnish Geospatial Research Institute, but uh, we have a very big partner network uh, that is providing uh, services for, for uh, those. We target to help businesses and public organizations to, to utilize the location technology to um, we help uh, them by giving tools, testing infrastructure, business and technical consultation and training. So one of the technical infrastructure that Local Location Innovation Hub is supporting is this GeoE3 platform that we currently demonstrate. We also uh, help them to find funding opportunities. Uh, we have selected uh, uh, four different themes like built environment, bioeconomy, which uh, includes the forestry and agri and food health and well-being and transportation and logistics. Those are the main focus areas, business areas that we are focus focusing with the, with the location technology. And then we also are doing AI, machine learning, high performance computing, and cyber security uh, as uh, most, of the, most of the hubs are doing. I show you the, the partner network. The part, most of the partners are kind of Finnish, Finnish companies, um, uh, the, which is the first part of the section. The second part of the section is the, um, the associated partners. Uh, OGC is already uh, 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 being a partner there. So they are bigger companies uh, as an associated, com uh, associated partners. But I also want to focus on this European core data provider network. So we are going to build this network based on the GOE3 project and we are inviting more people to come and join uh, uh, to our data provider. And we, we believe that there, there is a future based on, on, this, uh, based on this, um, this network. The Location Innovation Hub will provide uh, support for the data spaces. So we want to work on this reference data spaces. Uh, we will seek funding uh, on, on this both in Finland and Europe. We uh, work on the innovation aspect, which is creating these innovations. Uh, we provide certain uh, guidelines like location API business manual, some data integration guidance. I will talk about those a uh, little bit uh, 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 just uh, after this. And then we provide testing infrastructure. For example, we provide next generation navigation space in our uh, um, location in Otaniemi certain urban test environments, uh, and I, I think we want to um, uh, uh, connect those urban test environments also in, in, uh, with other urban test environments in Europe. 
uh, and certain novel data sets and, and test areas. A little bit about the location API business manual. So we will be uh, looking the the data space support center guide, uh, how to build the data space. But we also want to take into account the OGC APIs, but also Wirefare, and, and also those big questions uh, on, on the security, ethical questions, copyright licenses. Believe that if we are successful with this, these guidelines, it, it helps to, to build this kind of um, API-based business with, with the location. And then a little bit about the global and national guidance. We, we, we see that there is uh, movements on the, on the open uh, street maps. There's this overture maps foundation providing data. Uh, we want to give uh, guidance how you can create your uh, successful business using this type of global data sets together with national data sets. So that is something that we, we are also, also working working on. We um, think that there is an idea to build this kind of location data space for the European data spaces and currently we are looking to start thinking about this kind of project um, uh, uh, let's say in autumn uh, to prepare this one. If you are interested to work with us please contact us and, and, and we, can, we can start discussing that. And finally, um, we would like to encourage you to join the European Core Data Provider Network, which would be the basis of building the, uh, the success of GOE3. And we want to increase the data uh, coverage, not only mapping agencies, but also, also, for example, meteorological and other agencies of Europe to, to create success in the integration of the of the data based on, on on national data so that was my presentation thank you and then we have Lassie's demonstration thanks a lot auntie and while changing the presentations there's one or two questions if there are any Just a short and very spontaneous question, because um, I saw in your uh, building blocks, of course, there is trust as well as one part or part one, one block. And uh, because uh, Leipzig, we are working on a, a project, it's a German-funded uh, project for identity management, but currently it is uh, it's it runs for us it's runs separately to our data projects so but we know there is interconnection of course between identity management and uh, uh, yeah uh, operating a urban data platform for especially when you want to uh, want to uh, run or want to operate this, uh, this 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 platform together with other municipalities and organization and so on and so on uh, or is there a additional to this I have people who want to use the data who want to get access to the data or to, uh, uh, have to uh, have to ad identify themselves is there an additional topic to identity management for you for instance identity management for for data set what uh, sets or whatever just a question or is it especially, or is it specifically for uh, for just to to manage the the, the user of, of data? Good question. Um, the the uh, yes, we well, I think it's a, it's a something that we should consider. I don't think we have considered it, it quite much. It's, I think it's a. I think if we would be putting this new proposal, we, we would have to look, look for that because basically uh, then I think part of the European data spaces, you would also have to look a little bit about the, the identity management. So that would be part of, the, of the, that new, new project, yes.
Yeah, uh, AIDAS, we call in Germany, we call it the European identity. Yeah. And so on and so on. And, so on. Uh, and uh, I was, I asked myself whether there is an interconnection, whether or there should be maybe the inter yeah, uh, yeah. interconnection. Yeah, I okay. think we, we consider that. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Okay. Thank you. So we already kind of moved into the panel discussion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then I'm handing over to, to Lassie, and uh, yeah, everything is set up. And good. Lassie, the, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, as a part of GeoE3 project, uh, a specific uh, data integration platform has been developed, and my task here is now to try to introduce you uh, the idea and, and then give some short demonstration on the platform. So basically we have a couple of uh, national mapping agencies being participants in the project and we are providing the data that they, they have available through an integration platform which tries to integrate data both uh, in a cross-border manner and also in a cross-domain manner to some extent. So as Antti already mentioned, uh, one of our uh, use cases and, and the areas that we want to support with our services is energy, and specifically renewable energy. And based on that uh, selected use case, we have then also selected a couple of uh, data resources that we regarded as being important for this use case. And based on that analysis, we have selected buildings uh, and roads from the National Mapping Agency's datasets, a digital terrain model and a digital surface model, if available. And then we have also been working with some climate-related datasets that naturally come from National uh, Meteorological Institute. And uh, when talking about climate, we are specifically dealing with uh, long period uh, average data values. And uh, mentioning buildings, we have specifically been concentrating on providing access to 3D modeled buildings in the, in the project, which is something rather new when we are talking about national mapping agencies and data sets covering the whole, whole country. And we have been specifically applying the, the latest OGC uh, uh, standards in the, in the uh, service access, OGC API features, OGC API coverages for data access, uh, vector and raster uh, formatted data access, and also some work for, uh, with OGC API processes to provide on-the-fly uh, processing services and then also some work with OGC API records for metadata support. And this all runs on a cloud platform, uh, which is in physically located in, in Finland, and we are accessing uh, content from the uh, countries uh, participating in the, in the project. So some, uh, a couple of more technical um, uh, illustrations. We are uh, using Django, uh, web development, web service development platform as a, as a basis for our uh, cloud service and specifically we are using PyGeo API, a product that uh, uh, implements those OGC API family of standards and we are using that as a, as a basic basis for our own uh, development work on, on the platform. So basically we have a couple of Django applications that each provide uh, a, a, an, an individual uh, OGC API uh, compliant service. That's an example of buildings, for example. And one of the main ideas behind our work here is that we provide uh, data sets coming from countries as, as data collections inside a single uh, service interface. So, for example, in this case, we have buildings coming, coming from those uh, five participating countries uh, accessing data from the national level using mo mostly the traditional uh, OGC legacy services. 
web, uh, web feature services and so on. Um, and then we have developed uh, those provider plugins to, to access the national level service and then provide the content to the um, uh, OGC API features implementation that we are running on the platform. And th this way we get uh, individual countries, as you see here, listed as data collections inside the single, uh, single service instance. And in this case we have um, even seven countries uh, present at the moment because um, uh, also France and, and Slovakia have been providing their services uh, to, to be used in our platform even if they are uh, outside of the project consortium. So in addition to those five participating countries we have data available also from some other countries. 3D buildings, as I said, are an important um, uh, data set that we have been working with and we have been able to provide some kind of coverage from all of the participating five countries uh, in, in 3D buildings. And um, as we mostly access data directly from the national level, in the case of um, 3D buildings, we have been uh, forced to upload a couple of data sets to the platform because there are no national services available at the moment uh, providing access to 3D buildings that we could have been using. So in the case of uh, Finland, Estonia and Netherlands, we have been uploading uh, 3D buildings, uh, data sets to the platform, but otherwise we access all the information from the national services. So we have been able to provide um, 3D buildings from all the participating countries. These are just examples. Uh, some of them are modeled in lot two level, meaning that we have roof um, models uh, included. In some of the cases we have only lot one level, meaning that we have just um, a flat, flat roof uh, in every building. Uh, one of the central ideas here is that we are able to access data across, across borders. And we are using here so-called cross-collection queries approach which has been defined for OGC API features so that we can, in a single query, ask for data sets coming from different countries. As you he see here, we have been listing buildings from Finland and buildings from Norway, and those data are uh, requested from the national level services, services, services and integrated then as a single response on the, on the platform. That way we can uh, develop an application like this shown here in which we have accessed uh, buildings from both sides of the Water River in the northern Finland, both from Norway and, 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 and from Finland. And these can be then uh, displayed and, and managed in the single application. And there is only one request uh, accessing uh, both of those datasets from the platform. In a similar way, we have been working with uh, coverages, OGC API coverages interface, although there has not yet been um, an official uh, specification of cross-collection query. We use the same mechanism here so that we can ask for DSM digital surface model from Norway and Finland. And when the bounding box, the query bounding box crosses the border, we will actually be getting back data from both uh, background services as an one integrated image from the, from the platform. And as Antti already mentioned and showed, the same um, is also possible with uh, 3D buildings. We are in practice accessing 3D buildings using also OGC API features interface. And then we can, in a similar manner, access uh, buildings across borders. Climate data, finally, a few words. We also added climate content with the idea of supporting the selected use case area. 
and we have our, we are accessing uh, climate data from five participating um, meteorological institutes. Uh, each of them providing different individual access mechanisms. And then we provide that data through OGC API coverage interface, meaning that we provide a gridded, uh, uh, interpolated representation of the point, point location observations from the weather, weather stations in, in each of the countries. And that way we get, for example, this kind of visualization like Spanish temperature in an in a interpolated form as a, as a uh, result of the coverages interface query. In a similar way, we can then integrate uh, those climate data sets coming from different countries, here integrating Finnish and Norwegian temperature uh, data sets together. So you find the platform from the address geoe3platform.eu and you are welcome to, to check and try out by yourself and provide feedback if you, if you find something to, to tell us, just let us know. There is also a develop, development version of the same platform available in, in that other address. As a conclusion for this part, uh, we have a dynamic integration on the service level, accessing content from the national services, specifically designed for a certain kind of use, air, use its area uh, uh, energy in, in this case. And we provide access to those data sets through OGC API uh, family of interface standards, specifically in this project uh, focusing on 3D buildings and providing access to 3D buildings from all of the participating countries. And also integrating climate uh, properties to the, to the same uh, service infrastructure so that that can be used as a parameter in the applications that potentially uh, make use of the, of the platform. So, um, finally I would like to show you some uh, simple uh, demonstration. Um, these pages that you see here are just um, rather uh, simple HTML representation of the interface itself. So basically there is always uh, a machine readable uh, service interface in the background, but what you see is an HTML formatted representation of the, of the interface. So if we look for buildings, for example, um, as, as I said, we have a collections, data collections inside the service, which represent individual countries. So here we are now able to proceed to the country that we are interested in. Let's now go to Finland, for example. Uh, and this is the... Um, level on the service called uh, describe collection. So here we have basically metadata of the collection itself. But we have also a map here that we can zoom in. And we have um, taken a, an approach here that we are able to always use a map based access to content. So we, can, we are able to zoom in into the data set and use a um, bounding box based query to access the actual content and for that we always need of course a base map and we are accessing a topographic base map, base map of each of the uh, participating countries to have an, an, a spatial reference. So now we are in the, in the level of the items already and if we go deep enough in our zooming uh, we should have then um, a vector buildings appearing, as you see here. We have uh, individual buildings being present on, on top of the background map. And we are also able to then go to see individual building. Um, we have here um, a detailed representation of the building on top of the autophoto the, the geometry. And we have list of attributes. And here uh, it, it's worth to mention that we have 
things like uh, temperature, uh, wind speed, and sunshine hours, which traditionally are not part of the uh, attribute content of buildings, but the, these are integrated on the platform based on the climate uh, data sets that we have available, so that we can now in, include individual uh, pro uh, climate properties to, to the building level. We have also um, forecast temperature here, which is a three hours from now temperature on the on the location of the building that uses the uh, Finnish uh, Meteorolo Meteorological Institute's EDR in the um, environmental retrieval um, uh, uh, service interface. Okay, um, you could look at 3D buildings, um, which is of course um, an important aspect here. If we go to Estonia and we zoom to Tallinn area, we should then be able to, to um, again select the area of interest uh, just using the zoom, zoom functionality and use the bounding box based. Uh, data retrieval to make this uh, as as um, intuitive as possible to access content. And as I said, we are here accessing the OGC API features interface. When I say view data, we will accessing that bounding box from the service and we get 3D buildings back from the service that we are then able to visualize and and uh, rotate the, the view here in, in, in our browser. Um, maybe one example from integrated 3D. This is an, a way to uh, again query data sets across themes. We are able to select certain themes like uh, buildings in Netherlands and buildings in Germany. Uh, which is the example that uh, Antti mentioned. Now we can zoom in to the border areas and it happens to be that we have um, 3D buildings only available from certain limited areas from the German side of the border. Netherlands is covered fully but uh, German is not part of the consortium and we have only certain uh, rather limited uh, areas available from the German side uh, regarding the 3D buildings. But now in a, in a similar manner we can again send a request to 3D buildings to the OGC API features interface and get back um, um, uh, data sets that now come from two different countries. Um, uh, originally this is the border borderline between uh, Germany and, and, and Netherlands here. So, um, I think um, I'm mostly done. Um, that was most or more or less what I uh, planned to do. Let us see if I can still come back and um, so maybe one or two query examples um, integrating content again um, for example here is the query that I mentioned in which we use the uh, OGC API coverages service interface uh, carrying out a cross collection query so that we are ac actually accessing content both from Norway, Norway and Finland and integrating those datasets together on the server uh, integration uh, service platform and we get one individual image back to the, to the service, from the service. Yeah, in a similar way, uh, for example, temperature uh, integrating content from Finland and Norway. So I think this is enough from my part. If you have questions, 
I'm happy to right, answer. Thanks, yes, thanks, thanks a lot, Lassie. So maybe there's one or two questions for, for Lassie directly to the technical demonstration. Otherwise, I would ask the... Oh, yeah, there, Lassie. Um, can you use the, the microphone there? No, it's for the uh, online. Is, is this data stored in the internet or are you using local data on the MCAs? Mm. As I said, the only case where we store data on the platform is the 3D buildings from those three countries. And the reason is that they do not provide access to that content in any service. Otherwise, we access the services directly from the original source. So if these 3D data sets uh, will be uh, supplied to the platform by uh, OGC API web service, it will also be possible to access them? No. Yeah, definitely, yes. Yeah. On the, uh, on the platform. And that yeah. was uh, a big difference with earlier platforms that always had, well, not updated data. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Further detailed questions, because otherwise we will have plenty of possibilities to talk now without in, in everybody. So I'm pleasing the, the panelists on the, uh, to come for, forward. They didn't make one for my for, for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, my, own. my my own thing. Probably uh, one one person is moving over there, or um, okay. <laughs> ah, it's a decision yeah. you have to make. <laughs> I come over there. Okay, let's check my questions that I have. That was brought a rod. Right. Thanks a lot for, for everybody who is coming up here. And I was quite proud of the, the setting uh, of, the, of the panel. But unfortunately, there are not so many people in the rooms because we have three other p sessions in parallel. For sure, they are uh, speaking, uh, being there. The idea of the panel was the, to bring together different levels of administration and different levels of um, yeah, with that, uh, outreach. So starting from Leipzig, for sure, that we are here in this uh, nice building here. And then said this uh, Beate representing that. And then on the other side, we have the international level that definitely <laughs> uh, Nestor and that uh, we're talking about and that the, uh, the biodiversity frameworks and that United Nations had been mentioned and that in your keynotes. And that. But then we have also the, the levels in between, the European level and then national level and that crossing the borders. And that, so it was one of the idea of kind of having the entire uh, administrative level of that. Then, for sure, we was talking about technique. That we had been we had been talking about technique all the time. So data spaces, data cubes, uh, in various ways. And then, but on the other side of the technique, there needs to be also the applications and what's what's necessary. So I wanted to have an economic view on that as well. So that's represented by by Helge Lübner. We got also from here from Leipzig. That was one of the aspects as well and that I wanted to have the people who are here in, uh, in the city. So we have three with me, four, <laughs> and then uh, the, uh, the European wealth from Helsinki who said welcome uh, to, to Leipzig. I wanted to, uh, uh, the, the panel was addressed as smart services for Green Deal. So as a an, as an very general topic and, said, and the first round of um, of the, the, the discussion or, or your points is that rather broad as well. You will have the possibility of giving your own introduction as well like said, uh, about the uh, smart services for Green Deal and what is actually your perspective and your opinion on that. Who wants to make a start? Jordi, sure. Well, it's 
running. Okay. Yeah, so uh, in my presentation, and I, I think in the in the first uh, round of presentations from from all of us. Uh, so, can you hear? Okay. Uh, yes, we could talk about uh, evolution from from SDIs. So. Uh, this is because SDI uh, is Spot Yield Data Infrastructure. For those yeah, who's not knowing that, there are many. So uh, we were traditionally pushing just for data availability, which was already limited. Let's say uh, would be uh, with this. I'm uh, saying that it's improvable now. But we were lacking, for example, all the sector of uh, the data sharing, the, 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 the user side, which is uh, what, uh, in my view, uh, these uh, European data spaces should uh, uh, develop. Uh, so uh, traditionally, the user perspective was, um, I would not say not considered, but uh, uh, the work on, on that area was minimized somehow. So. In my view, uh, in this uh, new concept of data spaces, w we should improve data accessibility and availability. We are in using these uh, building blocks that uh, we have been talking about, uh, and we know about the past experience from, from a standardization, but we, we, are, uh, uh, we have room for improvement. Another of the, of the concepts that I think that uh, it's missing now in SDIs is this uh, in layer of uh, data intermediaries, mm. which uh, should be covering, uh, let's say, uh, a part of the work that uh, was missing from in the SDI concept, which was, for example, uh, professional, services, let's say, or, or the sectors which are professionals in, in the uh, data transformation, data integration, and uh, I would say even uh, those that uh, are really proposing smart services for uh, directly for the end users, so uh, in, in any of the different uh, domains that, uh, so, I'm really interested in in, in the data spaces uh, in this part. So, mm. so uh, working in the in how to offer these services, uh, how to design these services in order to really make something that we have not done uh, at the moment, and uh, try to get the most of the data which uh, could be available uh, uh, in the future. Let's say. Uh, with this uh, improvement of, of of the data accessibility as well, but uh, uh, I would say that most part of the interesting things are in, in the other side, the user side, in, and how how we should combine, and probably I don't know, but uh, technical people like like myself or <laughs> we, which uh, have been traditionally working in the in the interoperability part. Uh, maybe we can help, but uh, there is another sector that uh, should be active now, I think. Excellent, excellent points, excellent start. Is it you handing over the, the microphones? Or the yeah, maybe, yeah, um, as a municipality, um, we look at the topic, smart services for Green Deal, we look from the, from the content or from our tasks so as a municipality so we have to organize the transformation of our energy uh, infrastructure okay what which data are could can be helpful which data we, we do need for planning for uh, for 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 uh, yeah for simulation we look for participation of the bill so in the, in the whole uh, cycle of let's say planning uh, implementation, operation, so, and uh, that's why, uh, I mean, Green Deal, this means for us uh, transformation of our en energy infrastructure, this means uh, the transformation of our mobility uh, sector, this means, the, um, uh, as I said, mentioned already, we are a part of this uh, EU mission, uh, climate neutral and smart cities. This means we have we need to, uh, services to be able to to get to to let's say to to um, implement or to form these uh, climate contracts with uh, 
with enterprises and with the inhabitants in the city and so on. So that's why uh, smart services for us are more than, let's say, data or data platforms. They, we have the whole, we, we will, we need and we are right now develop the whole collection of data services for for Green Deal. Do you understand what I mean? So this is not only, so it's, of course data is very important and we, we, we develop uh, our pl platform and then we uh, involve IoT uh, uh, platform from our pa uh, energy provider and uh, just to, we collect data, we provide data, we regenerate uh, data from sensors, we, we, or we use digital twins um, for the whole energy, um, yeah, for the infrastructure planning, uh, we need uh, we we do use digital twins for participation, just to to get in the discussion with our uh, with our inhabitants and so on and so forth. So there is a very big variety of services we will use, and we are right now, uh, which are right now under construction. <laughs> Right, the implementation part is always the, the challenging homework to do. Yeah, but it's not a, as, as maybe all of us recognize or we have learned, it's not a technical challenge, but it's, it's a challenge, it's a human challenge to involve all the people and to convince the people and uh, to organize the, the, the process. So. Exactly. I, I would like just to, to directly continue on that because to convince people, we all think we have to inform to make people smarter, to gain, give them all the knowledge, all the data, all the information, all the information overload, all the bullshit. I think if we, if we look back uh, for a moment and we would remember, uh, there was this wonderful book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where one habit was try first to understand people and then to be understood. Mm -hmm. So I think we might have all these data. Impressive. What I saw today is really impressive. We have data spaces, data about everything. So we have, in some sense, all the answers. But which are the questions? What are the questions we try to answer with all these data? And even the people, the ordinary people, don't know their own questions because they are somehow not question-driven. Even politicians are not question-driven. They are driven by the opportunities to be re-elected and by other opportunities to get high-ranked uh, um, um, social media things and so on and so on. So we, I think we, we, we should try to first understand the question, then the challenge here is that the, all the questions are content driven. I have different questions in different contents. If I'm here, I have different questions. If I'm at home, I have different questions, and so on and so on. And that is not easy, even, 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 easy to solve. And the next thing is, if we go to uh, what are the questions in the context is, what do these questions mean to the people? What is the real meaning beyond the question the people might address? If, if we do our research with questionnaire, we address our question. That might not be the question of the people. Mm -hmm. So what are the people's questions? What is what they figure out as their main sense of being humans in nature, for example? Do we know that? I had a PhD student who discovered that people who are more connected to nature are better in being in feeling their own well-being, which is really amazing. Closer to nature, better well-being. So, having said that, I go even one step further. The meaning comes out of a process which I call a recursive operation between indicating phenomena and practicing around these phenomena. So this recursive operation gains meaning for the people. And if I talk about um, practices, I, I would extend the idea of data ecosystem, not only to information ecosystem, but to service ecosystems. We, if we once understand that service is the ongoing process of exchange and change of resources, that is what nature does all the way. It reduces entropy by life, and then it rises entropy by all the things around life. So it's an ongoing process in nature, and only the humans invented waste 
And we have to reintroduce ourselves into nature by these ongoing service ecosystems. And once we understand that, we can uh, get an idea of what data we should supply to the people to be better able to reintegrate in this ongoing process of service, of a service world, natural services, ecosystem service, human service. And now it's time that we serve the nature, because otherwise it is killed and we with them. So in that sense, I opt for try that we try first to understand the people before we offer them a bunch of data and kind of information. Very, very good point for that. I would just on my own experience, I was running a pilot. I was thinking from the data to the user. And then in the end, we're figuring out we should reverse that. I mean, think from the user and then try to find the way back to the data. Right. You was grabbing the microphone? Yeah, maybe uh, I just tried to operate <laughs> uh, this uh, this principle because uh, when we uh, when we start to develop digital twins, first we sit with the users and we ask, what is your user story? What wh why do you need this data, or which data do you need, and what kind of uh, how which quality of data, and how often? But what what is your user stories? And you will see that every single person. I I mean, here in the administration, but also outside, will have somehow um, an own user story. So um, maybe this could be a very small step to operate your principle. Hmm. And uh, let's, uh, in the final end, this is a very uh, normal way to develop uh, digital services to, to have this user story step in between. Right. Digital services, smart services, as I said. And, and yeah, at one point to that, because it's really important, we, we, we also have to apply new methods to figure out what people really are doing and thinking, what makes sense to them. We had the question from, from some dealers, Riva, Aldi, Lidl, and all this kind, why do people shop with us? Is it the smartness of the business, the freshness of the fruits? Is it this or that or that? And then we applied a new method so that people created the reality in their own language. And we figured out that it was just the distance to the, to, to the supplier and nothing else. Good point already, but let's add well, other if I, opinions. If I continue with that, I, I also agree that the users are very important and that's a normal practice nowadays to include the users in the process. And, and sometimes it's, it has been forgotten in this, the, let's say, when we talk about European national or even, even uh, city le urban levels, that we actually need uh, users to be involved in that. I'm, I'm actually a strong belie believer of the interoperability. And uh, basically, I, o o what I mentioned in my presentation is that we need to move to this, let's say, this API-based businesses. I think the, uh, the current situation, if we think about what the, uh, let's say, companies or startups or businesses in general in Europe are doing, everybody uh, or consultancy companies, they, they, they spend huge amounts of time to collect this data that, that the users or the clients want. And that's a big part of every project. So if we would be able to, to kind of downsize this part of the of spending, it would be more cheaper for the, for the users of clients, more, uh, more quicker to, to utilize, more, uh, let's say, more accurate and more, uh, more up-to-date information that is utilized if we move towards the API business. So that is, in, in my view, the thing that we need to be thinking and actually, the, uh, if you think about this European national or even the urban level, the use cases are actually in, in those countries, in those cities. Uh, but what we need to be ensuring is that the companies that are building these applications, they can, um, uh, they can kind of copy the same approach to, to all of German cities, all of French cities, if we don't do that, we, we will lose this game with the, uh, let's say, these internet giants. These are the only things that are currently able to, to provide data that is usable. If we go to the national uh, level or, or urban level, 
the solutions are all, uh, very local and you cannot re you cannot copy this solution to other uh, other cities or other countries easily and and for example if i went to berlin uh, last year there were very many startups there and when i asked they and even in related to location information and when i asked that can you actually sell this to 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 Estonia or to Denmark? No, we can, we cannot. We, we can sell it, sell it in German-speaking areas. That was in some cases the answer, uh, and and they, then they gradually start approaching the the European market. But obviously, that's a very wise situation to to grow, grow very uh, let's say um, planned. But I think we need to kind of have this kind of interoperable solutions. And one thing that I want to say also is that related to European data spaces is that actually I think we are ahead of the game with the location area because we have been developing these SDIs many, many, many years. If I look at the other areas of the data, there's not, nothing there. So that's why they need this, this let's say, uh, trust component and identi identity component, etc. So we are let's say leading this game so let's use our advantage mm. and let's say take this serious uh, code to european data spaces so that what we can provide we can actually do a lot of things that nobody else can do at the moment so i will stop now <laughs> great great uh, great points api business that's uh, I, I will i will take that into my yeah. into my uh, thinking here we go nestor so I, I fully agree that the question comes first, right? But but there are um, some questions that are there, and everybody has them clear, and we are not providing the data for them. So I give you a couple of examples. Um, the European Commission, but also member states of the European Union, they have the mandate to report on a number of uh, aspects of, for example, ecosystem status, changes in ecosystems, status of their species, and so on. This is a very clear, identified need um, for which there is no data enough, and we are not providing enough data to them. Is it because we don't have the data? Well, I would say partly yes, but partly, partly it is because we are not being able to put the data in a way, first to mobilize the data, and second to put the data in a way that is actually informative for those purposes. Um, on the one hand, uh, we are several of us are scientists, yeah, and we are interested on, on science questions, not necessarily on helping administrations to make uh, assessments. On the other side, uh, administrations are very often uh, limited in the resources that they can devote to do, do those assessments. So I think that putting priorities on on the kind of questions that we can actually address today, and and very often those are questions that uh, have a legal mandate. Uh, questions or needs have a legal mandate. Uh, this is the first step. In the area of biodiversity, it is uh, address the needs of the habitats directive, of the birds directive, nature research or law, what I presented here. But then there is the other side. It's, it's a side on the data mobilization, and I would treat them as users as well. So people who is collecting the data, uh, and uh, there is a lot of data that is being mobilized, and we don't know the reasons why uh, or we don't fully understand the reasons why all that data that is collected in research projects by um, NGOs, by local, regional, and national administrations, why that data at the end of the day stays in a drawer of someone and they don't want to, to put it there. Yeah? So there's a lot of valuable data there um, that actually can be used for that. Yeah? So, so I think we, we also need to understand Exactly. That, uh, I, why I agree that, that on a scientific level the questions are there, and on a political level, abstractly enough, they are there. But I give you an example where I have no idea what the data would tell me. I have a little hedgehog in my garden, which is pretty nice, and we meet every year, and I don't know whether it has a family or not. But I'm aware of his service, because he eats the sluts in my garden also. But now I T taking care of the slats, I would say, well, shouldn't I kill the hedgehog because saving the slats? So what is, what is a good database to make a good decision for me in my garden? That would be an applicable data set for me to help me make a decision to make a greener planet or more diversity. 
Je veux répondre directement à ça ou nous laissons la décision de décision Je l'aime beaucoup, donc je ne vais pas le tuer. Non, mais je pense que la partie de la mobilisation, je pense que c'est peut-être la partie la plus faible. Je pense que c'est la partie la plus faible. Je pense que nous pouvons faire beaucoup sur les SDIs, sur les SDIs. Je pense que la plupart de ça est... Je ne dirais pas que c'est solvé, mais au moins, à un grand extent, c'est très avancé. The part of you know mobilizing, collecting and mobilizing the data. This is a place where I think we really need to put a lot of effort. And it's almost connected to your question before. It's almost a social um, aspect of it more than infrastructure one. This is always go getting back to the fair principles and that findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. That's one of the, the points. But Antti, what uh, one comment to you is that. Um, I find it most most of the cases where people do not publish their the data, it's a kind of issue with shame that we, we don't believe that the quality is good. So we, we didn't collect that. We collect it for our own purposes. It's, it's not good enough to be published. So that's one of the reasons. That was when we investigated why, why people wouldn't publish or agencies wouldn't publish data as an open data is that they, they don't believe that it's, it's either it's, it's old, it's not updated, there's issues with quality, etc. So that, those are the reasons why the data is not published. Now we are already moving into the kind of, I had a second question prepared, but we are actually <laughs> already there. We can maybe sh share that with the audience as well. <laughs> it was the question about the, well, the different kind of administrative levels. Europe is now here in Leipzig, or the international level is here in Leipzig. And then we have federated data, data, data spaces. Do they make sense, actually, or is that just a, a waste of, of time? So, but with that, we can probably continue with the things uh, that is floating around. And I would also open the, uh, the questions to the audience. So if anybody would like to uh, address the questions, there are microphones here, then just go there. And uh, you can drop your, your question as well. well I, I, I was, the whole day I was thinking, how did it happen that we have a street system in Europe and that we have rules for the traffic of cars that work all over Europe? And they work. We, everybody knows what to do. We know the science. We know everything. And that is true, not even only for Europe. How did that emerge? There was no European Commission to introduce that. And, and I doubt that it worked so good if it has been introduced by the EU. I'm not sure. But that is something to discuss. How did that emerge? And can't we learn from the emergence of that system, that infrastructural system, to to supply people with relevant information, probably, as an infrastructure. I'm not sure, but it, it was a thought I have, just a thought, thinking of the emergence of systems and what, what we have to do to enable systems to emerge. And that is a great system. It, it works. And I'm, I'm really surprised and impressed at the same time that it works so fine. And there was also, there were always some kind of local approximation together with centralized ideas. And I think this process has to go forward and backward in the EU much more than it does to, today, but probably you have better experience in your cooperation with the EU. They agreed on standards pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you were first. No, I was willing to comment on some of the comments from Nestor. I, I think it's important to, to highlight that uh, there are different types of users. So I totally agree with him that uh, user uh, and the questions should come first. But the issue is that there, is, there are so many different types of users. So we have the, the administration users at different levels. For example, uh, the Green Deal is uh, probably mainly oriented to, to answer the questions from uh, European Commission needs uh, about the environment. But uh, there are other, other, there are different sectors. There are users in each of these sectors. Uh, we should adapt the data spaces to each of them. Uh, we should consider that there are also the citizens, and uh, in my view, the example of uh, cities, uh, it's very nice because uh, they are pushing for, uh, or they are getting detailed data with sensors, they are trying to offer services which are 
uh, thought uh, with the citizen in order to serve a specific purpose. I think that the role of cities in, in that area is crucial and, and in data spaces, but uh, I think cities should not do things differently, so uh, probably they should, they, they should be continuing this work, let's say offering and thinking about uh, which are the best, uh, the best uh, services for, for, for the citizens of the city, uh, but at the same time uh, also offer this uh, wide range of data they are getting uh, through APIs so that other actors that there are playing in the market are able to exploit this data in different ways which maybe could even improve the such uh, services. So I think that the concept of uh, this market of data space or whatever it's called, uh, it's to try to uh, put the data there and then offer all these actors, which could be from public sector, from private sector, uh, the possibility to uh, come up with something which is useful. So, um, that's all. Yeah, um, actually, I wanted to raise the question regarding, for instance, in Finland, uh, there is there the uh, are there um, rules? regulation uh, in funding programs that uh, everything with what is uh, developed with public money should also be public code for instance uh, this is a, a principle which is coming slowly by slowly in the in the in the german uh, funding program slowly by slowly and right now we are in a uh, in a big program with uh, Munich and Hamburg, it's uh, called Connected Urban Twin, and this is a very big um, funding program for cities in, in Germany. Uh, uh, 73 cities are uh, in this program are funded, and we are with Hamburg and uh, Munich in one consortium, and there public money is public code is mandatory and I think this is a very important principle as in the same time uh, if you get uh, not only based on the on the services which are developed in this program but also on the uh, uh, approaches blueprints for instance for a digital twin so it's not only the interoperability the standards you have to use to suit the, the, the IT architectures you we, we develop for our urban data platform it should, should it refers also to the blueprints for digital twins for instance for 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 energy uh, for the energy transformation and so on and so forth and there should also be an obligation uh, that that there is a, a, a very strong application for replication what we know from the horizon programs at the EU level so that when cities developed uh, solutions they have to be they have to have a uh, re uh, replication pro um, replication concept so that that it is uh, that there is a guarantee that uh, what is uh, implemented in Leipzig as a solution can also be replicated to other cities because it is funded by EU funding or by German funding this is um, and uh, I, th I have the feeling it's not um, there are um, you, you can find funding programs which uh, involved this uh, principles, but is that, uh, these are not all pro programs. So this, I think this, that this is one uh, problem. <laughs> uh, and yeah, maybe I would be interested how it is in Finland in funding pro in Finnish funding programs, for instance. Different, different governance there. Um, how to be polite. Um. <laughs> I think you hit the, let's say, very difficult point in, in the Finnish administration that the municipalities are independent and the government cannot control them uh, in, in any way. So, uh, so that is an issue that um, I, I agree that, the, for example, these funding programs could be a good way to do it. I think we are doing that currently. We, we, we changed the law that in social um, services we are doing that because they, they took it from the municipalities and created the, this kind of new administration level that is controlled by the government now. So that is one one way to do it. But then, the, for example, uh, the municipalities still have the data, data collection uh, in the area. 
and there's no uh, guidance what they will do. Um, so it's only those, let's say, those um, uh, software pro providers that provide software packages to them that they give the software which gives some kind of um, standardization because they are using the same database, but that's about it, unfortunately. I think what municipalities do is, is really amazing because, but the question is that they are very close, what they provide is very close to the needs of people and to the mandate. So there is a very uh, strong connection between what is the mandate of the city, uh, what is needed and what is provided. And uh, I mean, here, for example, in Leipzig, you can find information on every small parcel of, uh, uh, of a house, of the backyard of a house, whether the soil is contaminated, what is the depth of the water table. I mean, many, a lot of information now. The problem is when you go to upper scales and to other uh, political levels of organizations, the responsibilities become distributed. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is not such a close connection between the need of information and the, and the administration itself. And there is where uh, things start to, to be less favorable for developing systems that, that actually can provide all the information needed. And at the same time, it is uh, as you go higher to the level, uh, is when you really need to promote networking. Yeah? And, and this is where um, all the ideas of trying to connect between uh, different stakeholders, uh, researchers with administrations, with user needs and so on, uh, become important, but also much more challenging. So I think that uh, municipalities are a great example of, and, and consortia of municipalities also of what, what can be do, done. But at some levels, we can do the same uh, things in the same way. So if you want to, for example, at the European level, uh, the reporting uh, on almost any aspect of the environment is not a mandate of the European Commission. The European Commission has to collect data from, from the countries. Then the countries need to collect data from the municipalities or, or the regions or whatever. And then their things become much more fussy. Eh? So establishing systems for that is really, really challenging. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a clear, a clear indicator that we need a business model mm. behind all the activities we try to introduce. Even a city needs some kind of a business model, how to get the money to finance all these things, whatever a city does. And um, <clears throat> finally, the society pays for everything. The question is, how do we arrange these payments? And I could think about introducing all these data spaces and let the people decide by paying for the data what they really want to have and then put a little tax on these payments and then you get your money back. So that is a question of a business model we have behind that all and we think, I think we should think about that early enough. Otherwise we pay out a lot of money and we don't get back anything. So in that sense, we have really to think in, in kind of service ecosystem and if we talk about markets, we definitely have to think about uh, um, uh, business models and how, how to get the money back somehow. The responsibility of the user. That's, yeah, that's function, <laughs> exactly. right. It's a, it's a good, it's an interesting idea. But what is the European Commission thinking about that? <laughs> the governance of that? I think that uh, in general is a good proposal. So uh, there are many many experiences where maybe we are defining uh, different types of information which is needed for, I don't know, the management of the environment or the monitoring of the environment to take uh, actions and take uh, political decisions on, on, the, on, that, on them. But uh, in some cases, uh, it's not really really clear which is the benefit to, to the final user if we know which is the final users. So uh, in general, I think that uh, there is a lot of data which has proven to be somehow uh, useful. Uh, this is the concept of, for example, core data and services, which are those um, traditionally those those data sets that uh, are provided by national mapping agencies, uh, the different layers of a topographical map, for example, but uh, some other uh, information. So this is uh, totally clear, and I think this is also mapping to the concept of these uh, high-value data sets that shall, shall be provided 
uh, for free in open licenses, etc. But then I, I totally agree that um, maybe we don't know really which which is the data that. Uh, and uh, in this market, it's, I, it, it's also be such, this, such kind of business models that should be somehow defined uh, or out, outlined by these coordination and support actions that we mentioned, uh, particularly for, for each data space, so that where there is a particular need, publish this need, and then there is a wide range of uh, actors there. Uh, this is data intermediaries, for example, that should provide this information or try to derive it from, from existing data. Uh, but of course, I think it's totally in line with the new concept of uh, the, the idea should be that uh, things are not closed. So mm -hmm. it should be a kind of uh, on the fly system, which is updating itself and trying to to get all these uh, needs. Yeah. Right, perfect. Any questions from the audience? That there is still kind of. Are you still with us? <laughs> Question from you? No. <laughs> okay. Any po any points again? Right. Then we kind of going to the la. Yeah. Sure. No, no, you go, yes, for it. Um, go, go for it. <laughs> because we shouldn't forget that it's not a one-way direction. Mm. Uh, because Cookery. the data we we provide, we want to provide, and we don't do it right now in a perfect manner. Even if you say, okay, there are a lot of data published uh, in, the, in in Leipzig, uh, I would say oh, there are much better open data platforms and we are right now uh, uh, yeah it, it, the platform is right now under development so again and uh, but uh, the data we we publish this, these are in the same time data we use for ourselves so there is already a, there is already a use for us and um, and then uh, it's a kind of additional um, additional mehrwert. What is mehrwert in English? Edited. Yeah, yeah. Well, you edit um, when we publish it, and, and then of course there is a even five years ago, this first cities who who published all their data. Uh, via open data platform they recognize uh, there is no run from 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 enterprises or from the civil society on our data and uh, and uh, and the let's say the learning was that you have to interconnect this public data or this open data with uh, certain let's say activities like hackathons challenges with um, formats of participation and empowerment so you can it's um, so if you want to have a really targeted uh, use of the data uh, or you want to get into interconnection with the society, you have to p provide a kind of format, a participation pro format or whatever, just to to get in bo so that both sides start to use the data or to develop ideas. So. And f yeah, as I said, it's not a one-way direction because, in the same time, we want to have data from the from the people for citizen science projects or whatever. So that's why uh, I believe there there will be a mixture of data which are uh, provided free for free, and there are data uh, which which are open, but where you can where you have to pay a kind of small money just because there is a big effort behind to 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 provide the data, so it will be a mixture, I think. Hmm. Unpaid, right. Let's make a short closing session, uh, closing round, and just in a one, two, three uh, sentences, your, your uh, closing uh, remarks on Green Deal and data spaces. So let's start where, is it from one side, or who wants? I, I tried to make it in three sentences. I think it is a biggest challenge in in the existence of human beings to save the planet, because if we don't save the planet, we don't save ourselves. On the other side, I think humans can be smart enough to do that if they are free enough to, to apply their smartness in new products, new services, all the green things. So and in that sense, I highly 
belief in entrepreneurs and startups to really change the world. It's not mainly politicians who change the world. It's mainly enterprises and startups who try to really improve the world to make it better. And I think if we wouldn't have them, we would more or less be lost. But I still believe that we will make it. Good point. Yeah, Mister. So I, I think, I mean, the Green Deal and the environmental crisis is such, should be such, such a high priority in the policy agendas um, that economic, uh, the economic uh, limitations shouldn't be the problem now for developing uh, data and data infrastructures uh, and so on. But we also need to acknowledge that their development very often doesn't result in an economic value. Yeah? So a lot of the information we are speaking about, species, uh, ecosystems, even ecosystem services, very often, yeah, we know that they, have an eco they may have an economic value or they actually have and have a very strong impact, can have a very strong impact on society, but putting a value on that and relating that value to the development of the information systems, I think that's that's a bit dangerous, yeah, because very often it's a benefit for society that it's much wider than just the economic value. Good, good point. Too, uh, you will have uh, this uh, opportunities to discuss uh, later on. And, uh, so I, w I would say in the end that um, I agree that basically the data that we currently have in all of all, all of all, uh, cases, I think there's a user user need because it's collected, somebody's paying for this data collection, so nat naturally there is a user need for doing that. I think we are now discussing, let's say, new uses, uh, also the, the European level of uses of this data, and, and that's why we see that there's, there are issues how, what we have to solve, and I think we can solve it so it's not impossible, uh, but, uh, but we, we have to kind of work on, on this item. We, we have to cooperate, network, and, and I think this is a good uh, ex example of doing that. Great. Th thanks a lot for that, for that statement, closing statement. And then we have the, uh... If, uh, if I would uh, have to summarize uh, so, I think uh, it's important uh, that uh, we are thinking on the final users. This is one of it, and which maybe the interoperability experts. Maybe I can consider myself in in, in that area because I've been working on that since years. But uh, maybe, of course, we should uh, continue working. But uh, maybe it's the time to also get involved other type of expertise, which is really, maybe these startups that uh, he mentioned, uh, really experts in, uh, uh, without the knowledge, technical knowledge of how to put this data together, how to use it, uh, try to come up with uh, fresh ideas on uh, how to uh, prepare and design these uh, smart services in each of the, in, in each sector, in if, depending on the type of user, etc. Uh, this is, I think, uh, something which is missing from from previous uh, uh, pushes for for this interoperability and data sharing. And uh, yes, on the other side, it's also a matter of uh, of really willing to change something. Uh, do we want to really change the? the environment, improve it, uh, so this is more a political thing, uh, of course, but uh, uh, what uh, it's important is that at least uh, we are providing the data which is available as much as possible, so, uh, and there are different uh, different uh, initiatives, uh, the high data datasets, uh, mm. uh, etc., that uh, are in that direction, but uh, Data should be there in order to uh, somehow uh, make it possible to, to provide these uh, fresh new services that hopefully could uh, in improve the situation. Great. Thank, thanks a lot. So the last, yeah. the last so summary I, of the uh, entire day I, is uh, on I, your uh, shoulders <laughs> now. <laughs> OK, I, I believe there is not in every part or p sector of um, uh, let's say the transformation. There is there, there is a business model 
I don't believe that. Uh, and uh, there is a very strong uh, need to to for governance by uh, the by the I, I, maybe not by the politicians by the political level, but by public administrations, and um, and uh, and it will be of course it will be a mixture in every city or like Leipzig or other cities. Of course, they are very interested to let's say. To, to support an, a very uh, vital and innovative ecosystem for startups and enterprises. So this is a natural need of a city uh, because this is one very important sector uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of urban sustainability. But in the same time, there are a lot of parts uh, that market is absolutely not interested in, for instance, is the market interested in standards, or what, uh, should be the is there the EU level? The EU had to say we have, we need standardized uh, charging facilities because it is for the use of the of the people, so that you don't have so many different solutions, for instance, and uh, and and this one very small example, but and at the at the um, at the city level, I mean there are uh, we we are also responsible for low income. Uh, households, people, the market is not interested in, and we are also responsible to provide to, to safeguard, uh, let's say, a, um, a clean environment uh, for our citizens. And and there are a lot of uh, topics uh, or work, uh, yeah, how to say, action fields. Uh, let's say a municipality is responsible, and uh, of course. Um, we are we can we can provide kind of uh, yeah environment that uh, that enterprises can develop solutions and that uh, but it's it's not uh, unfortunately we can't wait for the uh, the market and in many topics there won't be a market so and that's why there is a need for action by the public administrations I, I think we should be aware that a business model doesn't not necessarily need money as a currency in in society you have different currency in that sense so Okay, I'm stopping the discussion here. Thanks a lot for, for uh, all the also the controversial points on that. Uh, let's give a, a round of applause for the panelists here. And we can continue the discussion uh, outside. There is sparkling wine, wine, and uh, juice, water, whatever you you want. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for the also very great day. A lot of inspiration many ideas and many topics to discuss now.